Um, I'm sure we'll be introduced to them shortly. I received the minister's apology. Cabinet is meeting physically this morning, but the Recording deputy minister is here. So deputy minister, good morning and welcome to you and your uh, delegation. Uh, SIU and Hawks are present um, as well this morning, General. <clears throat> so what we'll do is we're gonna go to the ESCOM presentations and ESCOM matters in their entirety first. And then the SIU will come in and then the hoax will come in. So we'll get that global picture and then we will uh, then proceed uh, accordingly. Um, welcome the head of unit of, you're not late, don't worry. We just, we just, uh, we just eager beavers we took advantage of, of time, so there's no problem, HOU. Um, <clears throat> so welcome Advocate and TV, the head of unit of uh, say, um, Mr. Chair, specifically, good morning to you and welcome to you and your team. As a background, this committee is, as you know, SCOPA, of the sixth parliament. I will say two things only. We have met with ESCO more than any other entity or department as this committee. We've conducted two oversights. We've had 16 meetings in this term and three meetings on ESCO related matters totaling 21 engagements on ESCOM matters more than any other entity. That's how seriously we take the ESCOM matters. So I think that background and that introduction should tell you everything you need to know about this commit. We need ESCOM right, functional, effective and fulfilling its core mandate financial viability and financial sustainability, the necessary reforms and not throwing financial solutions to non-financial problems, consequence management, contract management, the meeting of deadlines, the whole nine years. The other policy matters and the other policy headaches, if we need to engage with them, we'll talk to the ministry. We'll talk to the political principles and have that discussion. So <clears throat> I just thought I should give that background. We, 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 are, we, we, are, we remain fundamentally worried and concerned about the state of health of ESCOM, the rolling load shedding or blackouts as others call it, whatever it is, speaks to and explains the problem of ESCOM in the most explicit of ways that there's a problem. <clears throat> so I'd like to introduce for your benefit and then we'll come to you, um, DM, to have your opening remarks and then the board can be introduced. <clears throat> I will start here. It's the Honorable Tolashe. Uh, next to him, here is the Honorable Hadebe with an H, is very particular about that. Uh, and then it is the Honorable Fanminen, the Honorable Lise, Maza, yes, the Honorable Somio. Honorable Somio also chairs the Standing Committee on the AG. And then it is the Honorable Mente. And then at the back is the Honorable uh, Pukis. Honorable Swartz is not here. Honorable Zibula is not here. We've got there. Um, apologies. And then is the committee secretariat um, in its material uh, roles and functions, uh, which is present. And then I am Mkula Wathlema, the chair of the committee. So I thought I should introduce ourselves versus the first interaction and first engagement with the board um, of, of, of ESCOM. So I would like to take this opportunity to hand over to the Deputy Minister to make uh, any um, preliminary opening remarks that you may have. And then we will go to the chairperson of the board and then the 
presentation, which we have become accustomed to it being led by the CEO, but you will delegate as you deem fit. And then head of unit, we will come to the SIU presentation and then general will come to you. Mm -hmm. Colleagues, are you fine? Good to go. All right, sharp. DM, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Chair. Uh, greetings to the honorable members of the committee, as well as uh, the teams we have. Uh, uh, you have already referred, Chair, to the apology, uh, Minister Godan, who is attending a physical cabinet meeting after some time. Uh, present from the department, I'm also accompanied by the acting uh, director general uh, together with the DDG, uh, two of them are here. Uh, Chair, I, I really do not have much uh, to say except uh, to uh, affirm uh, the importance uh, that you have attached. Uh, I think the committee is not simply just engaging ESCOM for the sake, it is because of the importance of energy security uh, for the country. It is a matter that uh, uh, both at the departmental level as well as uh, in uh, the rest of government, it is considered one of the uh, foremost uh, critical matters that require a resolution uh, continuously as it afflicts uh, the aspects of uh, community life uh, in, in all respects. In that vein, uh, the, the, the president uh, had uh, um, address the nation and uh, pronounced on a series of interventions. And in those uh, interventions, I would like uh, that we locate as part of that, uh, the appointment of the new board at ESCOM. And uh, I would really like to take the opportunity, you've already acknowledged the chairperson of the board, uh, uh, Mr. Paul Makwana. Uh, without me saying much, uh, Chair is no uh, uh, stranger to the public sector environment, uh, having served a number of boards, uh, but also a distinguished uh, leader in the business uh, community. I would like, uh, Chair, with your permission, as you had indicated, to then uh, hand over to him and uh, for him to introduce the other board members. Uh, where after we may then proceed with what is otherwise a meeting uh, to provide feedback uh, to the committee insofar as the resolutions uh, that the committee had taken uh, before uh, what progress is there to be made uh, for which the team I'm sure will uh, take will 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 deal with that. Uh, uh, that said, Chair, I hand back over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, dear Mr. Chairperson. Over to you. Thank you, Chair, and good morning to distinguished honorable members of SCOPA. My name is Mpo Makwana. As has already been indicated, I'm the new chair uh, of the ESCOM Holdings Board. We are delighted to be here this morning to hear from this uh, committee, as the chair of the committee has already indicated in terms of what key top of mind uh, concerns you might have that you wish us to help respond to as part of our duty to account on how the ESCOM utility is led and managed. I'm joined today by fellow board colleagues, uh, three board colleagues here in person. The rest of the board have joined uh, virtually via Teams. Present with me here to my left is Mr. Mteto Nyati. Um, what we've done is the new board, uh, with the permission of the shareholder minister, we've added a new board committee based on our initial assessment of what will be required to achieve the turnaround that uh, has already been alluded to. We've created a board committee called the Business Operations Performance Committee. And Mr. Nyati is the new chair of that committee. Also sitting behind me is Mr. Bekin Jalinjali, who is the chair of the Social Ethics and Sustainability Committee, which is an existing uh, committee in terms of the MOI of ESCOM. And also sitting behind me, uh, I think last time I checked, they were sitting together, 
is Ms. Fatima Ghani, who's the chair of the Audit and Risk Committee. On teams, uh, or virtually, we have uh, other members, such as uh, member of Audit Committee, Ms. Ayanda. Uh, I see also we have uh, members of uh, the board, uh, Mr. Clive Leroux, Dr. Busisiwa Vilagazi, um, but also in terms of committee chairs, we're joined by Ms. Triforsa Romano, who is also the incoming chair of the Investment and Finance Committee. Um, and other members sadly couldn't join us. We expect to be joined shortly um, by the chair of uh, Human Capital and Remuneration virtually. She's landing from out of the country and possibly as soon as she joins, she'll be visible on the team's uh, virtual screen. The ESCOM executive team is led here this morning by a face well known to yourselves, Mr. Andre Derater, who's the ESCOM group uh, CEO, uh, joined sitting next to him by the CFO, uh, Caleb Kasim. Uh, and next to Caleb is Jan Uberolzer, uh, Chief Operating Officer, and behind them, we have uh, the Group Executive for Generation, Rulan Matebula. We've got uh, Group Executive for Government and Regulatory Affairs, Ms. Ntato Miyuku. Uh, the Head of Group Executive for Legal and Compliance, Ms. Mel Govender. Chief Procurement Officer, Ms. Jane Three Sankar. And the GM for Forensic, uh, Chris Baloy. Uh, GM for Human Resources, uh, Tula Ningele, Dr. Tula Ningele. I'm sure you worked hard for that PhD, you would want me to say so. Um, and then we've got the acting GM for Primary Energy, Shinal Nagar, as well as the uh, AGM for Stakeholder Relations, mm -hmm. Natasha Stolle sitting to my right. As I indicated that as the accounting authority of uh, a state-owned enterprise as a board, we are aligned with Scopus mandate to safeguard the public purse and ensure that ESCOM operates within the acceptable prescripts uh, of all the required regulatory compliance as uh, per Scopus oversight. Since our appointment in the past two weeks, the board has been rapidly appraising ourselves on the status of ESCOM's management, particularly in terms of their effort at mitigating concerns that have been raised regularly by SCOPA in the more than 20 uh, engagements that Honorable Chair, you've referred to. We are mindful that uh, top of mind of this committee is irregular expenditure, the matter of deviations in terms of extension of contracts, the repeated audit findings, and uh, I assure you that the new chair of audit and risk has already rolled up his sleeves. There's uh, uh, an, an incoming induction session that has already been scheduled ahead of our first full sitting of the board in line with the formal schedule on the 31st of October. However, we've already had two sittings as part of us getting ourselves up to speed. And as I indicated at the outset, in terms of establishing board committees to ensure that each board member, as part of lending, uh, a lending shoulder to wheel, they already know where their focus areas are. Finally, Chair, um, we are mindful of the need to have robust consequence management in ESCOM, uh, and also to ensure that uh, operationally, we ensure that ESCOM uh, finds its way out of being a strain on the fiscus and on the economy. Uh, and so, hence, we created this particular committee on business operational performance, because we believe that that's where the, the rubber is going to hit the road, uh, particularly if that turnaround is to succeed. With those few remarks, uh, allow me, Honorable Chair, to hand back to you uh, as we perhaps then hand over to the group CEO to provide the presentation as requested. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much. Um, I indicated the apology of U Mamzebola, but I should have said she's online. So she's not here physically, but she's um, on the virtual platform. Mm -hmm. Colleagues, I think then let's get going with the presentations. 
um, and then we will have the engagement after. So I'm um, CEO, over to you. Thank you, Honorable but, Chair. Yeah, maybe, it's just, sorry, so I think it's only fair. Let's get the introductions of the SIU and the Hawks. Sorry about that, because they're head of unit, and then we'll go to General Libya. No, thank you, Honorable Chair uh, and Honorable Members of SCOPA. Uh, I am Andy Motivi. I'm the head of the Special Investigating Unit. I'm joined today, uh, Honorable Chair and Members, by my colleagues, the Chief National Investigating Officer, uh, Mr. Leonard Lecheto. I'm also joined by the Head of Communications, Stakeholder Relations, and is a spokesperson, Mr. I'm also joined by the Chief Legal Counsel, Dr. Wells, also joined by the lead investigator in this, uh, in this investigations, Mr. Viven Gavender, and we are also joined by our Head of uh, Strategy Monitoring, uh, Ms. Uh, Mpotulo. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Advocate Tibi. General Dr. Libya. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, uh, Honorable Chair, Honorable Members, uh, the participant uh, in the Augusta House. Uh, with me, I'm Lieutenant uh, General Libya, the National Head of the Directorate for Priority Crime Investigation, also known as the HOPS. I'm accompanied by the 18 Divisional Commissioner, uh, Major General Nkosi, whose permanent position is the component head of uh, the Priority Crime Specialized Investigation, uh, is sitting closer to me. And then at the back is also uh, Brigadier Maginyani. He is uh, currently acting as the component head for serious commercial crime, but his permanent position is uh, the head of uh, serious economic offenses. Thank you very much, Honorable Chair, Honorable Members. Thank you very much, uh, um, General. Right, um, CEO, um, over to you. Good morning, Honorable Chair, Honorable Members, uh, Chairman of the Board, um, officials from the Hawks SIU, uh, thank you for the opportunity to present to SCOPA an update on the um, progress that we've made with implementing the 2019 oversight visit recommendations on a quarterly basis as is required. We're going to discuss two major topics. The first one is uh, progress on the implementation of these recommendations. And then secondly, supplier referrals from the SIU. So if we can go straight to um, the slide that deals with uh, what we've been able to achieve so far, um, we've had nine successfully implemented recommendations, uh, and you can see there on the screen, Chair, with your permission, I'll take the document and the presentation as read just in the interest of time and efficiency, uh, but we are making uh, a fair amount of progress in ensuring that we uh, implement the recommendations made by this committee. If we can then move on to uh, progress, further progress on the implementation of recommendations, um, you can see there that we've implemented um, a comprehensive document and records management system. Uh, this is quite a, uh, an onerous task, um, but we are intending to be compliant with ISO 9001, uh, and we will be subject to audits in that regard. We have beefed up our supply chain management or procurement um, unit. We've now appointed Ms. Jane Tree Sankar as the chief procurement officer, and we've got two executive managers. And uh, we are seeing a step change in the way in which we conduct uh, procurement. I must also take this opportunity for acknowledging the very constructive role that National Treasury is playing in enabling us to um, meet our procurement requirements uh, in a compliant way, but also in a expeditious manner. Uh, vetting, uh, that is continuing. Uh, 
Uh, there's a slide on that, um, the following slide, as a matter of fact, and you can see there that there is progress being made, and in fact, the um, SSA made a presentation on vetting to our board at its last meeting, so that I think gives you an indication of how seriously this matter is being taken, not only by the SSA, but also by ESCOM, uh, including its board. If I can now hand over for an update on internal investigations to uh, Mr. Beloy, who heads up our forensic investigations. Chris. Thanks, Andre. Um, good morning, Honorable Chair and the Honorable Members. Um, the update, um, Honorable Chair, on internal investigations, bearing in mind that um, this is a continuous um, process which uh, con happens as and when we receive um, new investigations. Um, as of the 1st of July, um, Honorable Chair, we started with uh, 270 investigations and where we received 30 uh, new cases and we had completed um, 60 or 69. At the time, we had 239 that were progressed in various stages. However, um, Chair, as of the 30th of September uh, this year, uh, these numbers have moved in that we have since completed 109 um, cases and we, excuse me, we, we received 109 new cases and we completed 123. This being a cumulative uh, number as we deal with, uh, with the financial um, year. So these numbers um, continues, uh, Honorable Chair, on average, we receive about 25 uh, requests for investigations on a daily basis, which we subject to um, an assessment process. On the left-hand side is the feedback on the lifestyle audit, um, in which, uh, because we only do this internally and we have limited uh, authority, uh, the result being that we handed over 34 high-risk cases to the SIU um, for further investigation, and 16 of those um, have since been uh, been closed. We had level honorable 11 honorable chair um, for disciplinary um, action, and we've got six that are still um, under investigation. The feedback on the 11 that went for disciplinary um, action is that seven executives were found guilty and various um, sanctions were, were imposed, ranging from six to 12 months return warnings and suspensions of about 14 days. There were two executives that were found uh, not guilty and one executive had resigned in the th on, on, on the 30th of November, 2018. Uh, this happened prior to the disciplinary action taking place. And what we have introduced, um, Honorable Chair, is that the people that resign pending um, disciplinary action, we flag them um, in order to restrain them from returning back to the organization in the, in the future. Um, again, Chair, the lifestyle audit is a continuous process in that, uh, which involves data analytics, um, in which we um, which reveal that 3,812 employees at various levels um, had not declared their business interest as required by the policy of the organization. And out of those, 3,799 3, were referred to management or consequence management. And we're happy to report, Honorable Chair, that um, management have implemented those um, recommendations. And there is only 148 uh, of those employees that are awaiting finalization and 13 of those have, um, have resigned. Honorable Chair, the lifestyle audit cycle for the currently, currently has not commenced, and this is because we're giving the space to the general vetting process uh, that has commenced within the organization, as we did not want to run um, a parallel process. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Chair. Uh, I might just also add that we have implemented steps to um, freeze the pensions of individuals who resign 
in the face of disciplinary proceedings in order to uh, create a disincentive to people uh, not following the disciplinary process. With your permission, Chair, I'd like to hand over to Ms. Mel Govender, who is our Group Executive in charge of legal and compliance to deal with Recommendation 6.8. Thank you, Andre. Good morning, Honourable Chair, Honourable Committee, and our members are present here today. Um, Chair, I will take the presentation as read and provide material updates to the committee. There's four matters that I will speak to. The first one is on ABB, second is on Tegita, third is on Econ Oil, and the fourth, fourth relates to the pension fund of Brian Malife. Chair, in terms of ABB following the repayment of the 1.5 billion rand, ABB, ESCOM, and the SIU have been working together to finalize court papers to have the contract set aside. Simultaneously, we're working on new terms and conditions for um, the ABB contract. We're actually quite close to having um, a final executable agreement in place, and the matter will then be set down at court to have the court um, make a ruling on the set aside and to approve the new terms and conditions. It's estimated that the work, um, the time period for ABB to complete the balance of the work is two years. In terms of Tegita, um, there hasn't been much movement, save to say that the NDPP has been successful in having the assets of Tegita preserved. This matter is now subject to various forms of appeals by the business rescue practitioners and others, and um, ESCOM is supporting as required. Chair, the AFU has also had, um, has applied to have um, the assets forfeited. This is also ongoing. ESCOM is supporting as required, and this is also subject to an appeal. So we'll have to watch over the next few months how this progresses. Chair, there has been some development on econ oil. I won't speak to the historic econ oil matters um, in terms of which um, ESCOM had successfully had the, the board decision set aside to award the contract to econ oil. However, um, since we last met, ESCOM has made a decision to deregister econ oil from its supplier database. Um, the resolution is for a period of 10 years. National Treasury has been informed accordingly and requested to conduct its own investigation as to whether econ oil should be blacklisted as a supplier on the state database. ESCOM is engaging with National Treasury in this regard. Chair ESCOM is also um, resolved to have Ms. Mshlonzi, who's the sole director of econ oil, removed as- Just one second. Did you update the presentation? Because we don't have that slide. Chair, there's four matters relating to econ oil. The one that I'm speaking to is probably on the next slide. I see what happened. Okay, just just move forward. All right, it's fine. Thank you. Um, Chair, we have been engaging with with Ms. Nchlanzi to to make a decision as to whether she will be restricted from participating in any capacity in any tender process um, at ESCOM. This is ongoing. She has made submissions to ESCOM, which is under review. In terms of the arbitration with Econ Oil, this is also ongoing. Initial quantifications reflect an overcharge by Econ Oil of 1.2 billion rands. This will be determined prior to the arbitration um, commencing, and it's likely that the arbitration will commence early next year. Chair, the last matter that I'd, I'd like to speak to relates to Brian Malefi, and um, this is actually a good story whereby the pension fund has been successful in securing an order against Mr. Malifi's pension for the return of various funds. Eskom in itself is entitled to approximately 31.5 million, including interest. Subsequent to the order, Mr. Malifi has applied for leave to appeal and shared this is not reflected in, in the presentation as it's new, news um, hot of the press. This appeal um, application for leave to appeal has been dismissed, which means that Eskom can now enforce the order. Chair, I'd like to stop there. Thank you.
Thank you. Um, now let's move on then. Um, to Lani, uh, Dr. Ngele, if you can deal with recommendation 6.9 consequence management, please. Thank you, Andre. Um, honorable Chair and honorable members of the committee. Uh, in terms of consequences management, we have received uh, 389 uh, cases to date. Of the 389 cases to date, we have managed to close uh, 361. And those that were closed, um, 41 uh, resulted in dismissals. And uh, we have um, 26 of people that retired during the process. And we have uh, 157 employees that resigned during the process or absconded. And I would like to maybe explain the issue of resignation slightly. It is important that we understand that in terms of the case law, um, we are required to take discipline while the employee is still serving notice with the organization. If, they, if the notice period expires before we complete disciplinary process, we are unable to proceed with the disciplinary process. So most of our employees are sitting on a 30 days notice. And therefore, as soon as they realize that we are investigating or taking disciplinary action, they resigned. And if we are unable to complete the disciplinary process within that period of resignation, it becomes difficult to proceed. So that is why we would find a high number of employees that have resigned during this period. But if there is criminality out of that, we proceed with um, the lodging a criminal case. And the rest of um, sort of the balance um, of the numbers are employees that have received uh, sanctions that are less um, than dismissals, you'll find that they've received um, suspension without pay or they've received uh, final road earnings and so on. Thanks, Andre. Thank you, Tlone. Chris, if I can ask you to do 16. Thanks again, um, Andre and Honorable Chair and Honorable Members. I greet you again. Um, this relates to your recommendation to capacitate um, the ESCOM Internal Audit um, Division, to which um, we're happy to report, uh, Chair, that uh, all the 14 uh, specialized uh, resources um, have been acquired, um, six within the Forensic Department and eight um, in the Internal Audit um, Unit itself, um, which has um, contributed um, positively to our fight against the, the scourge of fraud and corruption. And as I indicated earlier that um, the number of uh, requests for investigations or complaints that we receive uh, at a daily average of about 25, um, Andre and Caleb has seen it fit to increase um, the forensic capacity. So over and above the, uh, the six that I referred to earlier on, um, they have approved additional 25. Um, which are fixed term contractors, and 16 of those positions um, have been filled already, and there are nine that are in progress. And we believe that uh, once we have um, filled these remaining nine, um, we'll then have sufficient capacity to um, fight the um, fraud exposures that we faced with um, as the organization. Thank you. Um, as I proceed to the next recommendation, which relates to the institution of um, criminal um, action, uh, which is also a legal requirement in terms of section uh, 34 of the um, PRECA Act. Um, we have made it um, a matter of rule and principle, um, Chair, that um, each and every um, investigation that we do conduct where there's evidence of criminal conduct, um, cases will be referred to law enforcement agencies with, without exception. And thus far we have referred 131 of those um, cases, 13 of which um, have been completed through um, the criminal, uh, the court process. There is um, unfortunately a bit of delay uh, in terms of which these cases are processed um, through the um, SAPS um, machinery. But we uh, engage continuously uh, with the SAPS leadership 
and provide support as the organization to assist them in completing um, these investigations um, uh, on time. And Honorable Chair, I may be with your permission, since that the SIU is here, I uh, would not want to, I would rather leave paragraph two for the SIU to deal with it in their own presentation. Thank you. Well, we want to hear how you, you see what they're doing. Uh, so the ESCOM perspective, uh, so we'd want to hear your own summation of things. So you can proceed with placing that on the record. Thanks, Honorable Chair. Um, first, the, the SIU, um, I must say, um, Chair has been um, very helpful to, to us, not only in the um, investigations that are part of the proclamation, but in supporting us as internal um, investigators, given uh, their vast authority and, and capacity. And the investigations that uh, they have been undertaking within uh, the build projects in Midupi, Kusile, um, Ingula um, have been um, proceeding um, quite well. And they're also looking at the um, appointment of uh, Mackenzie Trillion and enragement. And we also, they're also looking, um, Honorable Chair, at the, the call. Uh, because call issues have become um, a thorn um, in our uh, bodies around the uh, Bumalanga area. And the uh, SIU um, are working um, on, on, on that. Uh, they're also looking at the, the cloud uh, computing because there was, there's, all, there's been issues around software um, licenses. So uh, overall, um, Honorable Chair, um, as the organization, we are satisfied with the work that the SIU um, is doing and the support that uh, they are providing um, us. Thank you. Thanks, Andrew. Hey, um, thank you, Chris. Uh, you can... Um, See from that, I think that I can confirm that uh, Honourable Chair, the SIU uh, and ESCOM are indeed operating hand in glove, and it's a it's a really good relationship. And I think we we share common goals. And Advocate Matibi is. Um, I want to also thank him for his support. Um, on recommendation six thirteen, if we can ask our Chief Procurement Officer Jaintree Sankar to take us through the extension of existing contracts, please. <laughs> Honourable Chair, Honourable Members, um, in terms of managing the extension of existing contracts that are due to expire, uh, I'm pleased to say that we've put a significant amount of controls and in engagement with National Treasury have been able to make a considerable amount of headway on this particular action. Uh, for starters, we have provided the divisions on a monthly basis with a contract expiry report for 90 days, 180 days and uh, 12 months so that they can um, ensure that they're establishing contracts well in, in advance of the contracts expiring. We've embedded triggers in our systems in SAP to, um, to have early detection and, and inform them thereof. We also have committees to actually look at um, potential deviations uh, and expansions of contracts that are due to planning and actually then increased the controls that we put in upfront planning and supported from the procurement side as well where we could. In instances, and we keep them as minimum as possible, where there's scope or expansions that is inevitable, we've got controls that we've put into place with the relevant delegated authority to test the robustness of the applications itself and actually work in, in accordance with the uh, National Treasury newly enacted uh, PFMA instruction note three of 21 and 22. On that particular note, Chair, we must indicate that from 1st of April uh, 2022, ESCOM as an accounting authority has been given the delegation to actually monitor our um, expansions and deviations, and we've adjusted our committees to do so. In fact, it has reduced the turnaround times in terms of contracts actually uh, getting the attention that it needs because um, 
we make sure that governance internally uh, aligns itself in terms of dealing with the matters of contracts close to expiry or needing modification. So in compliance with that new instruction note, we are actually reporting back to National Treasury within 14 days of conclusion of any of those transactions as per requirements of the note. And uh, we then report back on a monthly basis uh, and we have been doing so. We then monitor the numbers and the numbers are, are, are still in line with the numbers that were previously in place when uh, National Treasury was doing those approvals. In accordance with the ministerial equity conditions, procurement planning, tender cancellations, and the management of expansions and deviations are part of those conditions, and therefore procurement planning has been entrenched across the divisions, as well as managing the contract performance against the budgets to reduce the number of variations and expansions. Lastly, we've actually uh, capacitated the various divisions by having contract management offices, uh, which will allow them to actually monitor uh, the contracts themselves in particular during execution. Thank you. Yeah, please. Thanks, uh, Honourable Chair, Honourable Members and uh, colleagues. Um, we've identified the five major plan defects at uh, Madupi and Kusile. Now, we have developed some modifications, some solutions, which we have implemented on the six units at Madupi, as well as the first four units at Kusile. Now, the early indications are that we have made really positive progress and achieving success. Just to table what, what I'm meaning is, if you look at the energy availability at Madupi, it has increased from 64% to 85% since, you know, the implementation of these design modifications. Now, the question will be what's happening at Kusile. Unfortunately, we, do, we haven't received uh, and we haven't achieved the same success yet because we have a FGD, flue gas, gas uh, desolarization plant at Kusile, which we don't have at Madupi, which is giving us some real challenges. However, I can confirm that those design modifications as we have done at Madupi has been done at Kusili. And as we now finalizing unit number five and six at Kusili, those are implemented prior to these units being put on online. There are still some additional uh, modifications that we will do as ESCOM. Uh, as an example, it's basically to uh, increase the flow distribution in the fabric filter bags as well as to look at some of the aspects in the gas air heater that is not performing um, the way it's supposed to. But in general, uh, we believe that we have achieved good success with these design modifications that we have implemented. Thank you. Chair, then moving on to coal quality management, which is a very important topic, and I think we did not uh, always pay enough attention to this but it has become a renewed focus area for management. And I'd like to ask Snell Nagar, the acting general manager for primary energy to take us through an update on that. Snell. Thank you, Andre. Good morning, uh, honorable members and uh, uh, chairperson and colleagues. Um, what you, we, we conduct periodic or quarterly uh, audits on all the labs that are doing coal quality analysis for ESCOM. Um, what you see on the board or uh, what you see in front of you is the results of that. All findings are followed up uh, timelessly and closed out timelessly as well. Um, in addition to uh, the coal quality audits that are conducted, we're also looking at other technologies that are being investigated to test coal quality. In particular, one of them is looking at an auger type technology to test coal when a truck comes to a particular power station. So when the coal is received, we, we're looking at testing the coal at the power station. So that project is in progress. It's not commissioned yet, but uh, those are some of the technologies we're looking to further improve coal quality management. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Honorable Chair and members. Um, in terms of the way bridges and offloading facilities at Kusile, we've managed to complete the temporary facilities. Those are basically three way bridges that will that is is monitoring you know the coal coming in, and then again three that is on the on the way out. 
So that is in, in, in place and it is working well, but it's working well for currently four units that we have on load. And it's actually only three because one unit usually of the four is on an outage. So we do have some logistical challenge that we have to deal with. We are in the process at the temporary facility to implement quite a few solutions to make the system more robust. And that is monitored on a weekly basis and there is very positive progress moving forward. So the temporary offloading facility is in place. Yeah, is it the solution? No, it's not. Uh, but we have, while we have this temporary, um, you know, arrangement, we need to make sure that we deal with that successfully. Now, in terms of the coal hopper, the civil uh, construction, the contract has been placed, so the work has commenced. Um, it is a challenging situation. However, I can confirm that there is ongoing focus uh, on this aspect. We're also looking uh, on an ongoing basis at the financial health of the contractor that we have uh, appointed. And we also have a plan B in place that should we pick up some, some challenges. Then also in terms of the last phase will be the West Access Road. Now that is under construction as well. And that will also be uh, completed before the end of 23. So by the end of 23, we believe then that this uh, offloading facility and the wave bridges uh, will then have a permanent solution. While I'm saying that, we also have signed a uh, coal supply agreement with a mining house in the last few weeks. And the mining house is now getting ready to build an offloading facility, as well as a conveyor system that will feed uh, coal around about three to four million tons per annum. Uh, into um, into Kusili power station. So that is in addition to the permanent solution that we are working on now. So it's to ensure that we have redundancy in terms of the coal offloading facility uh, at Kusili power station. Thank you. Thanks, Your Honor. Uh, Honorable Chair, as, as the committee has repeatedly emphasized, um, the reason for locating Kusili where it is is its proximity to New Lago. We have made very good progress in concluding the uh, coal supply agreement with Sariti, who are now the owners of that mine. Uh, Snell, if you can give us an update um, on that, uh, suffice it to say, Honorable Chair, that the headline is that uh, we cannot supply Kusila by road only. We need coal on conveyor. So this is uh, vital to the full operation of Kusila power station. Snell, please. Thank you, Andre. Um, Chair, uh, like Jan and Andre have alluded to, um, we've made good progress in the last couple of months with regards to the New Lago deal. We've signed a deal supplying coal to Kindle Power Station. We've signed a deal, uh, two deals already to supply coal to Kusile Power Station. Um, like I explained previously, the Kusile or New Lago colliery will be signed in tranches of coal. Um, so we, we, we've made significant progress in the last two, three months. The next sort of milestone is the contract or the tranche of coal we aim to sign by 31 December. We're progressing well on that, and that will then uh, allow the construction of the conveyor belt to begin. Thanks, Chair. I can continue on the take or pay, uh, on the Maduki take or pay. As we had reported uh, at the last session, we've uh, year to date or inception to date paid 9.7 billion rands worth of take or pay penalties. We have not paid any take or pay penalties in this financial year. Um, like Jan had alluded to earlier, the performance of Badupi has increased. So it is consuming the, uh, uh, the call it minimum offtake levels of the current agreement. So um, as long as Madupi uh, continues to consume that uh, or, or, or keep that performance, we should, in theory, not pay any take or pay penalties. I must have a stress, this is a monthly take or pay penalty. So any operational issues that or hiccups that could occur would potentially incur a take or pay penalty for that particular month. But otherwise, uh, you know, things are progressing okay on this side. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, the production of gypsum, the disposal of the gypsum at Kusili Power Station, I'd like to upfront say this is a process that we haven't dealt with, uh, you know, successfully yet. Um, and 
but uh, and we're dealing with that uh, earlier you referred to consequence management so we're dealing with this but uh, just as an overview so the inquiry was uh, sent to the market in 2020 end of 2020 so it actually closed however there was an assumption at the time that the cost will be a certain amount uh, 171 million if my memory serves me correct so the tenders came back and it was 2.5 billion uh, so unfortunately, that then kicked in another process. So we had then to make sure that there is proper assurance on on the process. Now, that has been a to and fro between our audit and, and forensic uh, section as well as the ERI colleagues. Uh, all the information has eventually been tabled. So I can confirm now that the preliminary report has been issued by audit and forensic on the 17th. That was Monday to procurement, so we don't know what is in the preliminary report. But what I can confirm is that we will deal with this, uh, the individuals concerned in the process why it has taken so so long. So, but the process is now ongoing, thanks. Thank you, Chair. Um, Honorable Chair, in terms of Madupi and Kusile, um, all six units, I do apologize, there's a typo, it's not I in full co co uh, commercial operation, we're in full co uh, commercial operation and connected to the grid um, up until the 8th of August last year when we had the explosion in the generator uh, of unit number four. So that unit is, is offline and only now plan to return to service by August, September 2024. However, as I said earlier, the uh, the, 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 the power station is actually performing very well. So as we speak, um, three of the five units or four of the five units are online with one of the units on a uh, on a planned outage. So, but all in all, really Madupi is performing well. So there is some still some outstanding work on the balance of plant. And the 18 and nearly 19 billion that we're referring to there We've put it in a couple of buckets, uh, so there's some basic works and then some provisions, some escalation, and then a contingency. Uh, so that is what that 19 billion is uh, is made up. So, and then in terms of, so we we believe uh, I'll get the next slide. I'll get to to finances on on the Kusile one. Um, 14 billion is outstanding. Again, we've got it on the same buckets. So that 14 billion is made up of basic work, some provisions, claims, variations, escalations, uh, etc. So four units in commercial operation. The last unit, unit number four, chief commercial operation, about the end of May. Now, so there are two units outstanding for commercial operation. Now, unfortunately, Chair, Honorable Chair and members, on the 17th of September, we had a fire in the gas air heater during commissioning exercise of unit number five. Now, as of yesterday, actually last night, when I had meetings with MHI, you know, the, the regional equipment manufacturer, the root cause is still not being identified yet. Uh, however, we had a similar fire on unit number two a few years ago, and based on the program, the repair program at the time, it was 12 months. So we preliminary have been now a delay of 12 months for unit number five. Uh, last night we we did uh, have some some arm wrestling, so we did uh, improve on the preliminary plan. However, that plan must be tabled on Sunday, the 23rd. And then we will start with the interrogation process. So unfortunately, I have to, to, to be open that unit number five will not be in place in commercial operation December 2023. But only if we say 12 months later, we then in, the indications are that it's December 2024. Again, I need to emphasize that this was during the commissioning of that uh, specific component. And we don't... For, uh, believe that there was any foul play so but we will have a very good understanding hopefully by the end of this weekend and then also to understand what the root cause was of this specific fire unit six is still on track for december um, for the middle of 2024 however there is an opportunity i don't want to make any commitments to do it before may 2024 
uh, if you look what is, uh, if you look at the progress of unit number five before we had the fire incident, it was to have it online way before uh, what we have set December 2023. If I can then just move on to costs. The costs are still as approved by the board. For Madupi, 145 billion. We have spent the 126. That gives us that uh, 19 billion variance. We will be within that 145. And then Kusili as well, the 161.4. Now, again, the difference between the two is because there's a FGD plant that has been implemented at Kusili. So I've asked the question to the team, um, what will the, the impact be, the interest during construction specifically for this incident? Uh, and the indications are 150 million rand per month because this unit is not will not be put into place into commercial operation. However, that's a commercial uh, transaction and aspect that we will have to deal with in with the contractor concerned, which is MHI. I can also confirm that uh, the MHI leadership uh, is fully aware of the impact of this incident on the country and the available capacity, because we talk nearly 800 megawatts. So it is really, it was a setback for, for ourselves. Thank you, Jim. Thank you very much, Jan. <clears throat> if we can then um, ask uh, Gentry Sanko, Honorable Chair, through you, to take us through the SIU supply referrals, Gentry. Thank you, Andre. So in terms of the um, supply re uh, referrals overview, perhaps first I could start with the uh, 99 list, or I would call them the referral actions that we received in May 2022 um, for administrative action. So we received that same list from National Treasury during August, and um, National Treasury stated that some of these suppliers have actually uh, transacted with ESCOM in, in the financial year. So if I couldn't, for the committee's benefit, um, indicate how those 99 referral actions are split up, only 55 of these matters are related to suppliers. The remaining of those are employees that may have transacted with those suppliers. And in those 55 suppliers themselves, only 42 of them are actually registered on the ESCOM vendor master database. So the difference, we actually cannot take much action because they have no relationship with ESCOM. So on the 42, six of them have actually transacted with ESCOM during the previous financial years. And two of those six actually have directors uh, that are linked to ESCOM employees and four of those suppliers has ESCOM employees as directors until 2016. So at the same time, because we were focusing on employee referrals, most of the peer with the SIU, we are going to extract from many of those SIU referrals, the portion relating to, to suppliers. And, and therefore we are working with the um, SIU to, to match up those lists and actually figure out from those, which are those um, suppliers that are actually doing business with ESCOM. So if we, if we look at all the different lists we have, we had 156 suppliers, of which 84 are unique and common across all lists. Um, SIU referrals focused on undisclosed and unauthorized interests of the ESCOM employees, but there is a lack of information to ensure that we could actually take them through the supply reconsideration process in terms of the actions that are needed for the supplies himself. But to this end, we are working closely with the SIU to unpack uh, information that may or may not be in the file so that we could deal with the remaining uh, uh, matters that could help us in the restriction process. And we've had meetings with, uh, with the SIU, our uh, ANF legal teams and, and procurement. Next slide, please. Um, if we are looking at the risk of those 84 supplies, which I mentioned was common across the lists, we had a look at um, 72 of those suppliers who are uh, on our vendor database, and we've actually put temporary blocks. What the temporary block on the ESCOM vendor database does is it prevents placement of new orders or payments, and it then has a process in which they come back to the CPO to actually unblock you know, based on evidence and information provided those 72 suppliers. 
12 of the others are not ESCOM vendors at the moment. We also have two suppliers who transacted with ESCOM while having ESCOM employees as directors, and these are currently under investigation. And we are working together and, and we expect to, to make more progress by the end of October. And I think uh, we can also confirm that we have implemented our supplier review process. We have a working supplier reconsideration committee and uh, we, we fully uh, constituted in terms of dealing with these referrals. Thank you. Honorable Chair, thank you very much. That concludes the ESCOM presentation. All right, thank you very much, uh, ESCOM. Colleagues, you've noted your questions. Let's just take the full set of uh, presentations so that um, the gaps can be filled. Um, and then we'll take uh, questions. Um, SIU, um, we'll come to you and then General Libya, you'll um, follow uh, next. I'm sure you've received the hard copies because we're only at the soft ones. So, so colleagues, you've got the hard ones. Proceed. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Chair. Uh, Honorable Bambas Skofa. Uh, we're presenting today the status of the SIU investigations at, uh, at ESCOM. Um, uh, and the presentation will take the, the following outline. Next slide. Um, uh, we'll cover the cover the legislative mandate, the methodology, uh, the outcomes and consequence management, uh, and then we go straight into the investigations by proclamations. We do cover the conflict of interest that has been referred to, the lifestyle audits, coal supply agreements uh, in detail and status, the build projects, cloud computing and software licensing contracts with SEP, and engineering and project management consulting services, in particular, Impulse International. We do also include in the presentations uh, the observations based on our investigation and the systemic recommendations, which we will engage further with as come on. And then we do then cover the summary of the outcomes and we continue to receive new allegations. If you can go to the next slide, which honorable chair, the, the honorable committee is quite familiar with our legislative mandate. I'll go through uh, the skills that SIU uh, also uh, has in executing our function. Uh, the next slide, I really want to spend a few minutes on this one. The Honorable Committee is really familiar with this slide, but uh, it's really the outcomes that we seek to achieve. So the presentation that we will make will be, amongst others, indicating the status of the investigation and the outcomes. Uh, on the left-hand side is the civil litigation process which we will in, in include in the presentation. Uh, the ESCOM presentation has already referred to some of the uh, litigation process, which includes some of the former members of the accounting authority and uh, one member of the executive uh, that we have instituted action to recover from. Uh, the disciplinary actions uh, ESCOM has referred Two in their in their presentation, and we will just really cover some of those. We are pleased, uh, honourable chair and honourable members, that uh, uh, ESCOM management, of course, led by the group executive uh, uh, officer, Mr. Director, that they, there's really traction in terms of holding uh, those who are responsible to account. And that's the part as we monitor our referrals that we would like to see. The referrals to National Prosecuting Authority, um, we do refer to that, but I'm sure at an appropriate time, the NPA would appraise the Honorable Committee on where they are with those referrals. We do also cover some of the regulatory referrals, including, of course, those referrals that uh, ESCOM presentations made 
uh, or included in terms of restriction of suppliers. And I'm glad to hear that uh, over and above what we have preferred or and recommended for restriction, which is uh, colloquially referred to as blacklisting, that if there is insufficient information that we should work together so that uh, that information is, uh, is provided uh, so that the process can, can be progressed to where uh, uh, the outcome is reached. Uh, at the bottom there, we do make systemic recommendations and I'll, I'll be covering those at the end of the presentation where we have made several observations around um, the, the methods that are used uh, to really commit corruption, maladministration, and malpractices, uh, and we would uh, we will cover those and continue to engage uh, uh, with the ESCOM management on how to mitigate those going forward. Uh, Honourable Chair, at this stage, uh, I'm going to really just hand over to uh, Mr. Lacheto, uh, who will take the committee through uh, the various investigations. And I'll come in at the end on the observations and uh, systemic uh, recommendations. Mr. Lacheto, over to you. Thank you, Advocate. And thank you, Honorable Chair and Honorable Member. Uh, in terms of the proclamation, as outlined, the proclamation R18 of 2018 is to investigate procurement of coal, the transportation of coal, procurement of diesel, appointment and payments to, to McKinsey, Trillian and Regiment. And also we're looking at maladministration in the affair of ESCOM and the non-performance by service provider in relation to Midupi, Kusili and Ingula Power Station. And we're also looking at the conflict of interest, looking at the failure by ESCOM employee to declare interest and ESCOM employee doing business with ESCOM. Then over and above, we also receive another proclamation, which is R3 of 2020. That proclamation look at the contracting and procurement of cloud computing services, software licenses and support services. Something happened in the presentation. engineering and project management consulting services in respect of the contract in Majuba Power Station and Madla Power Station. Then in terms of the status of the investigation, we'll start with the conflict of interest. And the way we have couched the presentation, Chair, we, we indicated the number as the, the time when we presented to ESCOM and also the current number. As we can see now, the, the first one, which is ESCOM official, who were potentially linked to entities that are ESCOM vendors, that is conflict of interest. There we have identified 334 employee. And in terms of the reporting, when we reported in, in SCOPA in February 2021, then we have referred 99 disciplinary referrals to ESCOM. But as we speak today, we have referred 135 uh, referrals. And the breakdown of the 135 is as follow. 117 is finalized. The ESCOM has taken decision. And out of that 117, there's a 67 guilty, 18 not guilty, 19 resigned, four retired, and eight were withdrawn. And there are still 18 which is outstanding. And in terms of the NPA referrals, when we last appear, we had referred seven, and today we can indicate that we have referred 14. And in terms of civil litigation, uh, cases will be assessed on case by case basis to consider the possibility of civil litigation against employee and companies. That is to look at these companies, whether how were they awarded contract and whether why were they awarded uh, uh, properly. Then the next one also conflict of interest, we're looking at uh, failure to submit declaration forms. There we're looking at uh, 5,464 uh, employee. And as we appear previously as COPA, the number was still the same as 5,452. And currently we're done with that investigation of which uh, in terms of ESCOM report, 5,434 were finalized, 
whereby 1,563 were withdrawn and 3,875 DC processes were finalized. And there were 26 outstanding DC that they were dealing with. In terms of other conflict received from whistleblower, we received 29 and we've made five the DC referral previously when we appeared to SCOPA and currently we're standing at 10 referrals and out of that 10, two resigned, two were dismissed and six received written warning. And same as this one case will be assessed on a case by case basis to consider the possibility of civil litigation. Then when you look at the lifestyle audit, a lifestyle audit referred to SIU by ESCOM, a number of them was 34. And out of that 34, 17 has been closed. One employee was dismissed, but on unrelated matter, then five is under investigation and 11 referrals have been made. And when we appear before SCOPA previously, we have referred 18. And now current status is that we have referred 11. And that's the breakdown of 11, where we've got seven guilty, two not guilty, one resigned, one retired. And in terms of the NPA referrals, there are currently nine criminal referrals investigation that are ongoing that we will be referring to ESCOM. And the same as this one, we will be looking at the possibility of instituting civil litigation against the employee. Then one of the matters where there was non-disclosure is the matter relating to SJM Tembu versus SIU and ESCOM. We, we mentioned this one because it's in the public. Uh, the SIU found that Mr. Mtembu, the former head of legal at ESCOM, did not make the required declaration of interest that he was required to make in terms of ESCOM declaration of interest policy. The SIU made referral to ESCOM to consider disciplinary action against Mr. Mtembu, and Mr. Mtembu brought an application against the SIU and ESCOM for an order that the court declared the finding of SIU invalid and unlawful. The SIU opposed the application and self and filed its opposing affidavit. The pleading are closed and the application has been, to date has not been set. The matter has not been set down for hearing. And in terms of the focus area relating to coal supply agreement, the first one we look at is the Targeta Bradfontein uh, contract of which the, 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 the update has been given. Here we look at the agreement between ESCOM and Targeta for the delivery of coal to Majuba power station to the value of 3.7 billion on the basis of the 2008 medium term procurement mandate, which was unconstitutional and the SIU made finding against various board members and ESCOM executive. We have not made disciplinary referrals in terms of this matter, because when we when we do did the investigation, uh, none of the implicated member had resigned. And if regard to NPA, the NPA investigation had already commenced when we started the investigation, but the SIU conducted money flow exercise and provided finding to the NPA in support of the criminal investigation. Then in terms of civil litigation, phase one contract was reviewed and set aside. That is 3.7 billion and future saving calculated at the time was 2.6 billion. In terms of phase two of the contract, the SIU instituted procedure against Targeta and the business rescue practitioner for just an equitable relief as a result of damage suffers due to poor quality of coal that was supplied to the value of 734 million. And phase three is related to the SIU supposed to embark on a civil action against the board members and the executive identify and counsel was appointed and, ad and he advised against this action whereby the prospect of success was poor uh, due to prescription. Then Targeta Optimum, the, the contract expired on 15 September 2016, that is prior to the start of the SIU investigation. And as such, no recommendation was made to invalidate the contract. Then prior to commencing of the SIU investigation, the Optimum deal had been extensively investigated by various entities. There also, we could not make any disciplinary referrals because the employee were no longer at ESCOM. 
And with regard to NPA also, we did uh, the SIU conducted money flow exercise where we provided information to NPO, NPA. Then with regard to civil litigation, civil proceeding has been instituted by SIU and ESCOM against various former ESCOM employee and former board members, a former executive authority and private individual to recover the 3.8 billion losses suffered as a result of state capture and involvement of the former directors and executive in it. And in August, 2020, Combined summons and particulars of claim were issued against 12 defendants, with the SIU cited as core plaintiff. The 12 defendants are the late Dr. Ngubani, uh, Pemaski, Mr. Molefe, Mr. Singh, Mr. Koko, and Mr. Mabude, and Mrs. Daniels, and former Minister Zwani, Atul Gupta, AJ Gupta, T. Gupta, and, and S. Uh, SI, ESA. ESCOM is only pursuing claims against seven former ESCOM executives and directors. That is the same, the late Dr. Ngubani and Pemanski, Mr. Molefe, Mr. Singh, Mr. Koko, and Mr. Mabude, and Ms. Daniel, based on breach of fiduciary duties and breach of contract. ESCOM had the matter placed under the judicial case management, and the first meeting was held on the 13th of September 2021 to deal with the defendant's objections and delay. It was resolved that a delay will be set aside to a day will be set aside to ventilate the issue to be dealt with in terms of the interlocutory uh, application, after which uh, the remainder of the issue will be dealt with. Uh, there has been difficulty in securing a date with the judge and effort to do so are still ongoing. An ex executor has, yet, has not yet been appointed for the estate of the late Dr. Ngubani. Then with regard to Targeta, the SIU found that the contract was unlawful and invalid in that it did not comply with section 217 of the constitution and ESCOM terminated the contract in, uh, in the value of 6.5 billion based on the finding of the SIU. Then we have not made disciplinary referrals because the members had resigned by then. And NPA referrals, we have not done it. And in terms of civil litigation, responded or defended have no assets and was placed under the business rescue. Civil litigation action was not considered at as it will be, it will not have been realized the losses or the damage suffered by uh, ESCOM. With regard to the focus area relating to the coal supply agreement, those are the contract that we're currently investigating. We didn't mention the name because the investigation is still ongoing. Looking at mine one, we are looking at one medium term contract where we're looking at also three short term contracts and the value is 9.3 billion, where the investigation is going. And mine two also, we're looking at one medium term contract to the value of 2.6 billion. Mine three, four medium contract, the value is 27 billion. And mine four, it's a one medium term contract and one short term contract to the value of 10.5 million billion. And mine five, we're looking at one medium contract to the value of 42 billion. And in terms of state versus Zulu and Mazibuka and others, this is one matters which was referred by the whistleblower. And the SIU investigated the coal transportation contract awarded to company uh, commodity logistic manager, that is CLM, to the value of 24.8 million. The evidence showed that CLM were used as, sub as subcontractors prior to them being awarded a main contract. Therefore, the true value of the, of the money CLM received was substantially more than uh, 24.8 million. The investigation found that Mr. Petros Mazibuko, an ESCOM senior manager, coal operation, and Mr. Tulani Zulu, an ESCOM contract supplier unit manager, were receiving fund from CLM, which was the contractor. The SIU embarked on a civil litigation proceeding to freeze the bank account of the ESCOM employee and disgorge the secret profit 
that they receive in the form of kickbacks. The SIU also has obtained an order from the special tribunal for the preservation of 11 million in the bank account of Mr. Masibuko. And the judgment has been taken on appeal. The appeal is still pending. The SIU made a disciplinary referral against Mr. Masibuko, who has been disciplined and dismissed. Uh, Mr. Zulu resigned after being interviewed by the SIU before a referral was made. The SIU has made 15 NPA referral against various individuals and companies, including two ESCOM employees. And with regard to the focus area relating to diesel procurement, those are the company that we currently investigating. Company one, which is we're looking at a short-term contract and the value is 277 million. And company two also is a short-term contract to the value of 799 million. Company three short-term contract, 1.1 billion. And company four short-term contract and 195 million. And we aim to finalize all this investigation by the 31st of March, 2023. Then with regard to the focus area on Bell projects, uh, we're looking at the first one is Kusili. At Kusili, uh, we are looking at 24 contracts to the value of 88 billion. And previously when we appeared on Scopa, we had made three referrals in relation to some of the contract that is uh, the, of the 24. And currently we can uh, indicate that we have made 14 referrals. And out of those 14 DC referrals, six were finalized. Out of the six finalized, four were dismissed, two resigned, and there's eight pending. And all of them are under suspension. And with regard to NPA referrals, with regard to this Kusili, we have referred 39 when we appeared before Scopa on the on February 2021. And currently we have referred 73 referrals with uh, NPA referrals, which, which has been made against individual and companies. Then various cases are being prepared for litigation against some of ESCOM employee, which has commenced. And with regard to Midupi, Midupi, you are looking at five contracts to the value of 7, 47 billion. And on this one, we have not made any referrals or for disciplinary or NPA, and the investigation is still ongoing. And the Ingula, we are looking at one contract to the value of 11.3 billion. Even there, the investigation is still ongoing. We have not made any referral. Then with regard to one of the contract, the ABB International, uh, where ESCOM gave feedback, we just want to confirm that the SIU and ESCOM and NBA, ABB entered into a settlement agreement. And in accordance with the agreement, ABB pay, pre repaid the 1.5 billion to ESCOM in December, 2020. And SIU is working with ESCOM to set aside the 2.2 billion contract. And also the contract had been irregularly awarded to ABB. Court papers in this regard are being finalized and will be filed shortly. SIU and ESCOM are in the screen with National Treasury regarding a new contract to be concluded with ABB to complete the outstanding work at no profit. The SIU also play in support role to the NPA and International Law Enforcement Agency to finalize this matter. With regard to Tenova contract, which was at Kusili, uh, Tenova made a voluntary disclosure in the region of around 1 million following a carte blanche exposure. Tenova made further disclosure around suspicious payments to Babinatlo in the region of 46 million. The SIU found evidence of corruption in respect of money paid to Tenova uh, to Babinatlo to various former ESCOM employee. ESCOM terminated the contract with Tenova and recovered 58 million in a form of bonds that were in place. And SIU made NPA referrals against various individuals and companies, including former ESCOM employee. The SIU is still investigating other payments that were made to Tenova. As this is a very technical exercise, SIU is relying on the finding of technical expert in this area and the investigation is ongoing.
And with regard to SIU versus Tlakudi and others, the SIU investigated the Stephanie Stock Izazi Consortium, JVC, JV, contract at Kusili Power Station for site finishing. The value of the contract was 782 million. The SIU found that there was a corrupt relationship between the JV and ESCOM employee, that is Mr. Mangope Franz Tlakudi, a former project director at Kusili, Mrs. Mildred Nonsanta Nyoka, a former Kusili senior manager, contract management, and Simon Makondo, a former officer, technical support. The SIU found evidence of flow of money, that is 105 million from ESCOM to the JV and then to ESCOM employee or agent of the employee through convoluted network of entities. Mr. Tlakudi Nyoka resigned prior to SIU investigation. A disciplinary referral was made by the SIU against Mr. Makondo and he was dismissed. The SIU has filed its summons and particulars of claims against the ESCOM employee to disgorge profit they received from the JV, and this matter is ongoing. NPA referrals have been made against all individual and entity concern. The P28 contract has been terminated by ESCOM. However, the investigation is still ongoing. With regard to SIU versus Moyo, the SIU investigated the Tamukelo contract at Kusili for the transportation of raw and, and potable water to the value of 341 million. The SIU found that an ESCOM employee, Ms. Moyo, received financial benefits to the tune of 24 million from Tamukelo through a convoluted structure of entity as well as family members. She received this payment in circumstances where she was responsible and involved in the appointment and managing of and approving of payments to Tamukelo. The SIU made a disciplinary referral against Ms. Moyo, who was dismissed after disciplinary process. The SIU has obtained an interim order to freeze Ms. Moyo's pension, and the SIU has prepared NPA and AFU referrals. The Tamukelo was terminated was terminated by ESCOM, that is the contract, in October 2020, prior to any finding being made, and the contract is still under investigation. Then with regard to proclamation R3 of 2020 cloud computing and software licenses, there we're looking at the procurement of cloud computing with SAP license. There, the appointment of SAP was found to be unlawful and irregular in that it did not comply with section 217 of the constitution. Disciplinary finding have been made against two executive members of ESCOM. However, no referrals have been made as they were no longer in the employ of ESCOM. NPA referrals have not have been made against six individual and in companies and civil litigation to the value of 1.1 billion is pending. Paper has been prepared and will be filed within the next month. With regard to engineering and project management consulting services, uh, SIU in, let me see. SIU investigating two contracts awarded to Impulse and uh, on Matla and Majuba Power Station. The SIU found evidence of a corrupt relationship between Impulse and ESCOM employee and their family members. And ESCOM has terminated its contract based on the SIU finding. Impulse International instituted civil action against uh, ESCOM in two okay. matters. The first was against ESCOM. Rotec industry, Industries in the amount of 22 million, and the second one against ESCOM holding in the amount of 62 million. Both cases were issued out of the Johannesburg High Court under the case number mentioned there, respectively. ESCOM is defending both matters and pleadings have been exchanged. The SIU contacted ESCOM and agreed that it will it will based it will be based on findings in its investigation and, and therefore the SIU joined the proceeding to ensure that contracts are set aside 
and that the damage and losses suffered are recovered from Impulse International and its successor in title or its official responsible. The SIU will coordinate any civil legal remedies by considering the legal action already instituted by SARS and AFU. The SIU has made NPA referral against various individuals and company in relation to its finding. Then I will hand over to Advocate Mutibi. Thank you. No, thank you, Honorable Chair and Honorable Members. Uh, we are, as I indicated, we make observations, and these observations are made based, based on the investigations. Um, and we, we, we will then engage extensively with ESCOM management to ensure that uh, these observations are understood and assist in the improvement of business processes, risk management, and all other related uh, areas of business. Chair, as you may, may have picked up, uh, this is just the comments I'm making before, before I go into the slides. Uh, the investigations has really uncovered the organized crime that is at ESCOM uh, and, and the schemes and collusion uh, between ESCOM employees, officials uh, at various levels, in particular senior uh, officials who were involved, and, and we are glad, we're really glad to see that uh, there's consequence management uh, and, and we should really not relent in ensuring that uh, uh, they are held to account. The modus operandi, the method which they have used to fleece the monies to, to uh, uh, conduct this act of corruption has been exposed. Uh, and, and we'll come, we'll come to, to, to that. And it's really, really important. Um, uh, and and we'll, we'll, we'll find time to re-engage with ESCOM management and the accounting authority so that this modus operandi can be unpacked. And as part of the turnaround plan, particularly areas dealing with corruption, maladministration, and malpractice exposures, that turnaround plan should really uh, have a focus on mitigating this kind of instances uh, from, from occurring in future. So with regard to the uh, conflict of interest, um, uh, we, have, we have really uh, found, and indeed, that ESCOM does regulate uh, the conflict of interest of its employees through a number of policies and procedures. Uh, so these this procedures would require uh, ESCOM officials above certain level to declare their conflicts. Uh, number two, that ESCOM officials do not, uh, without prior permission, you know, uh, conduct uh, business uh, with, uh, with, with ESCOM or conduct private work for remuneration outside ESCOM or accept directorships. Uh, we've also found that employees are prohibited from having personal or other interest uh, in an ESCOM in, uh, contract. Uh, whether as a supplier or advisor or by virtue of being a director or owner of a business or in any other capacity. Uh, this includes third party related. So we then, uh, uh, of course, uh, mentioned the, the possible uh, provisions of PRECA, uh, but probably just, just one section. Uh, but in the criminal investigations, and I'm sure that uh, DPCI uh, and, and NPI would be doing, they would be focusing quite at length uh, in, in terms of these uh, this, this, this processes. So we have found, of course, based on the investigations, that these policies and procedures have been wantonly, wantonly uh, contravened uh, and deliberately by, by uh, those ESCOM uh, invest, uh, officials involved. Um, uh, still on the observations relating to conflict of interest, we've conducted a desktop analysis of available database, of course, looking at the CIPC data and ESCOM vendor uh, employee uh, declaration of interest processes and the subpayment databases. Uh, these ones, these, they do not always identify the links between officials and ESCOM vendors. Uh, they've, they've actually perfected the way in which indirect payments 
uh, are made and kickbacks are made to them. And we do that, we pronounce on that on the last, the last bullet point in, that, in the structure. Where the directors of the ESCOM vendor are family members or friends of the officials in question, where the directors of the ESCOM vendor are co-directors of ESCOM official in other entities that are non-ESCOM vendors. In some instances, uh, ESCOM officials approach complete strangers. This is part of the modus operandi. They, 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 they approach complete strangers to set up subcontractors and bank accounts through which to channel funds uh, to, to, to officials. So this is a deliberate scheme uh, used uh, by, by, by the officials in terms of fleecing uh, the, the, the ESCOM. These links can only be identified from a review of bank accounts, which we did, email communications, extensive email search and communications, cell phone records that were analyzed, and other methods that investigative methods that we have used. What further complicates the identification of conflict is that ESCOM vendors often pay kickbacks to officials uh, indirectly. Uh, this is another uh, way that which they really hide uh, this this kind of this kind of payments by paying the creditors of the officials directly. Uh, in other instances, we have found uh, that payments are made to officials' school uh, child school fees, uh, or by paying the officials, service providers, and suppliers uh, directly. In terms of the uh, coal procurement transformation uh, transportation. Uh, this is the area, and I think uh, one of the uh, ESCOM uh, executives mentioned earlier on that this area is really quite the area of concern. Okay, the others are also of concern indeed, but uh, as we will pronounce, ESCOM officials in this case facilitate contracts with coal providers despite concerns about the coal quality raised by technical experts. So despite the quality, they still proceed. Uh, and ensure that uh, that uh, that coal is delivered, and no wonder that uh, the machinery uh, in the in the system would be affected as negatively as it is. Uh, that's that's actually even close to sedition, uh, uh, where this really members uh, should be should should really be taken taken on. Now, a number of technical reports uh, questioned the suitability of coal from Brackfontein mine, for example. Uh, for the Majuba uh, power station and the ability of the mine to procure the required uh, qualities. Despite these concerns, a contract was entered into with Tegeta uh, at inflated uh, price. Uh, we've noticed that laboratory testing processes were interfered with by submitting coal that was not from the Brackfontein mine for testing. Uh, this happened due to the deliberate action of ESCOM officials who made sure that the samples for testing were obtained in the absence of ESCOM observers, facilitated the swapping of samples by transporting samples to the laboratory in a truck that was not fitted with the uh, contractually required tracking device. The mine delivered non-compliant coal from areas that are not stipulated in the contract. This is achieved by manipulating the pre-certification process at mine, uh, that is certifying coal that is non-compliant uh, 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 with, with, the, with the specifications. Once the coal is delivered, is delivered, honorable members, at the power station, no further quality checks are conducted before the coal from different origins are mixed. Uh, and we were really glad that, uh, that this testing, this testing project and hopefully it gets speeded up because that project is really going to assist in terms of the testing of this coal. It is imperative, as we say, that the coal be tested upon arrival at power stations and prior to being mixed uh, with coals from other mines. Uh, as, as the time of uh, the investigation, we're saying this is currently not happening, but we are pleased to know that uh, it will be. Um, so in order to circumvent the controls regulating coal transportation pricing, uh, OSCOM officials collude with mines by entering into coal supply agreements where coal prices are inflated to accommodate the transportation costs. Transportation con contracts are then entered into between mine 
and transporters linked to ESCOM officials. Due to the fact that the transportation contract is between the mine and the transporter, the pricing is not visible uh, to, to ESCOM, and that's the other part of the manipulative conduct. One such coal is, once often such coal is procured from mines that are far away from the relevant power station instead of the mines that are uh, producing coal at the request quality that are situated close to the power station. And why do they do this is our observation to increase transportation costs. Mines and ESCOM officials colluded with transporters and our truck drivers to mix poor quality coal from certain mines with good quality from other mines, thereby and, uh, ensuring that the contractually required quantities are delivered to the relevant power station. Due to the fact that the quality is often uh, not tested, uh, once the coal is delivered to the power station, uh, it, it is not possible to identify the source uh, of the substandard coal. Again, we are pleased to hear that the project is underway to mitigate this going forward. ESCOM can only mitigate the risk of this happening, of course, as we say, by installing automated real-time combustion testing. This was really just our view, uh, that are able to link the results to a specific track, uh, and therefore source uh, as soon as the coal arrived at the power station and before being offloaded. This would ensure that the substandard coal can be linked and returned to the mine of origin, while ESCOM will not be able to, will not be liable uh, to pay to pay the coal, nor incur the damages to its equipment due to the overly abrasiveness of the of the bad coal. Uh, and this abrasiveness, of course, does affect does affect the um, the machinery as we understand. With regard to built projects, uh, our findings in many of uh, our investigation in relation to build project reflect that claims management, the claims management process, which we have seen in some of the some of the contracts that we have made a finding, is an area that is abused uh, by ESCOM officials and contractors alike in the following manner. This is just amongst others. Contractors submit inflated, uh, uh, unsubstantiated, duplicated claims that are settled by ESCOM officials, often by way of what they call global settlements. Uh, this goes without really being monitored, questioned, and so on. Uh, so this is this is how they really uh, collude with contractors. Contractors refuse to submit a substantiation of their claims, and ESCOM officials allow them to get away with this price. And allowing them is deliberate. This is our our, our finding as part of this uh, that is that was in place at the time. Contractors and officials manipulate claim assessment processes by providing incorrect and uh, selective information. Officials deliberately fail uh, to timelessly instruct claims assessors to defend ESCOM against claims, uh, leaving them with unreasonably short timeframes within claims to adequately prepare defenses. There's a mechanism within Telcom, uh, there's a board that adjudicates on some of these claims and the matters are really not defended. And as a result, ESCOM ends up, ESCOM ends up uh, having to pay unnecessary, significant, and huge amounts uh, that really makes ESCOM to lose money. Officials provide confidential information on ESCOM's legal position uh, in those claims process and potential defenses to the opposition. Officials circumvent the claims assessment process by issuing unnecessary and inflated variation orders. So those were the 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 observations, uh, honorable chair and honorable members. Uh, as I said, we make, we make various systemic recommendations. Uh, so, so we'll run really quickly through this systemic recommendations, which we will still engage with ESCOM management on to ensure that they incorporate them in their improvement processes. Uh, we refer to the vetting, uh, vetting uh, uh, process uh, through the lifestyle assessments, I suppose that then that will be found. Uh, uh, bullet number two, we refer to the risk profiling of uh, various employees, in particular SCM practitioners, contract managers, and so on. And of course, we the the the, the lifestyle uh, assessment, life, lifestyles, and financial transactions of high risk needs to be monitored. 
monitor declarations of interest vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the contractors that are that are coming in. Uh, management of information in, in, in obtained through declaration of interest. Uh, number four, build a database of high-risk officials and contractors identified in forensic and audit reports. Uh, the next slide is really to develop a system to red flag transactions approved by high-risk officials as those who uh, would, would really be uh, a concern on the SEP payment. Number, bullet number two, improve transparency in relation to procurement process. This, of course, uh, applies. Uh, and as, as we would always say, not necessarily at ESCOM, where we've pronounced ourselves during this uh, public procurement bill that's, that's underway, and we really believe that there should be measures that are brought in place to mitigate procurement corruption. Um, the last slide on the systemic recommendations. Uh, we are recommending uh, that independent expert oversight over the, the claims and variation uh, processes. Uh, of course, the bullet number two is quite technical. I'm sure the uh, ESCOM management would know how to do this. But the Kosile and Medupi projects uh, have really uh, been problematic in terms of completion. Uh, uh, we were really just uh, opining ourselves there in terms of rebase lining of those projects and ensuring really that uh, mitigation plans are brought into bear to ensure that they are completed. Then, at the, at, it, during the claim process, I think the defense of ESCOM uh, interest has to be reviewed in terms of who represents ESCOM. Uh, in, in that process. Application of consistent and, foren uh, and forensic approach to the assessment of claims for additional uh, time and cost in strict adherence. Ensure that the project documentation and records are maintained to rebut by way of substantiated alternative assessment inflated contractor claims. Uh, we are of the view that the ESCOM's first line of defense uh, is its construction project management teams. It is therefore essential that these individuals are properly skilled and working in ESCOM's best interest at all times. Central oversight of contract management is required. And of course, there's a, a number of historic payments that needs to be, that needs to be recovered. On the next slide, uh, we cover really just the summary of outcomes. We'll not go through in detail with that my colleague has covered as we as as he was uh, as he was uh, uh, presenting uh, uh, honorable chair without going into detail we received new allegations uh, and we've received these new allegations uh, which are which are currently being processed through the proclamation process and it'll probably be signed and uh, we are also involved uh, in ensuring that the state capture recommendations are acted upon, and we have made our uh, inputs into the implementation plan uh, process uh, that the president uh, would uh, would review and and and, and present to to parliament uh, on the date that has been set. Thank you very much. Uh, we appreciate. Thank Thanks. you very much, uh, HOU. I think with haste, can we go to the Hawks, uh, General Labia? Um, so that we can go to... to, 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 to Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Chairperson uh, and Honorable Members. Uh, I will be requesting the assistance to load on the system that uh, we should be sharing from the SIU and we will control it from uh, here. Uh, Honorable Chairperson, just as a point of departure, we will be... Uh, indicating that um, the figures that uh, may have been referred to as having been referred to the SAPS uh, may not necessarily correspond with what we are presenting because uh, once the matters are referred to the SAPS, they will be registered into the criminal system and uh, some of those matters that are in the uh, criminal system, case administration system, they will be sifting them. Some will go to the detective and forensic services, and some will come to the DPCI in line with the mandate. Uh, so I have noted the 
number of cases that uh, were referred to as 131, but uh, in our presentation, we will be talking about 83, which are the matters that uh, we are having on hand. And uh, we haven't shared notes with uh, Mr. Baloy, which we will do uh, in future so that we check which matters are with us and which matters will be uh, handled by the uh, detectives. We also need to be uh, indicate that uh, some of the matters that have been uh, highlighted during the presentation by the SIU, uh, some were previously handled by the DPCI, but uh, with the coming into place of uh, the investigative directorate in the National Prosecuting Authority, they have identified some of uh, the matters which come in the state capture as we work together that these they declare that they will be handling them. So we have as a result uh, allowed 15 of our investigators that were dealing with these matters to go and uh, work with the ID and continue so that there is no a disruption. So some of the matters will be handled uh, there. So the presentation itself, uh, Honorable Chairperson, uh, will be done by uh, uh, Major General Nkosi, uh, who is, I have indicated that he is acting as uh, the Divisional Commissioner uh, in the DPCI. The cases that uh, we are presenting are handled by all our three operational environment, that is the serious organized crime. There are certain matters that are handled in the serious organized crime, including the crimes against the state. There are matters which are handled by the serious commercial crime, which are uh, fraud related and uh, tender related uh, processes. And there are certain matters that are handled by the serious corruption investigation. So the, all those three operational components, uh, including others, report to the divisional uh, commissioner. So I'm now going to be uh, allowing uh, Major General Nkosi uh, to take us uh, through the presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Chairperson, and then uh, we will be controlling uh, the presentation as reflected on the screen. I submit. Thank you, uh, Honorable Chair and uh, Honorable uh, Committee members. Uh, I will be moving straight then uh, to, to the presentation. The first slide uh, deals with the over overview of uh, uh, the ESCOM cases. We have uh, made an indication of these cases per province. In the Eastern Cape, uh, we have uh, three uh, cases, of which uh, two of those cases are currently court cases, and uh, one is a uh, pending decision, is currently with uh, the prosecutors. Uh, in the Free State, uh, we have uh, four cases, of which four are under investigation. Uh, so we do not uh, have uh, court cases uh, uh, as yet. Gauteng, uh, we have got 21 cases, and out of uh, the 21, 10 cases are currently under investigation, four uh, court cases, five of those cases are provisionally withdrawn, and uh, on the provisionally withdrawn cases, uh, uh, some or in the main, they are returned to us uh, for further investigation or further requests and or directives uh, from the prosecutors. And uh, two of uh, the cases are currently a pending decision by the NPA. Uh, in Limbombo, we have got two cases, uh, one under investigation and one is uh, a court matter. In Bumalang, uh, 51 cases, and uh, a total of 40 of those cases are currently under investigation. Nine uh, court cases, two of the matters uh, were provisionally withdrawn. And uh, in the Western Cape, uh, we have got uh, two cases and uh, both uh, cases uh, are court cases. That gives us then the total of 83 cases uh, overall 
uh, and uh, 55 of those matters currently under investigation, 18 of them, uh, eight, 18, uh, it's uh, court cases and they provisionally withdrawn are uh, seven, three, uh, which are those uh, currently with the NPA pending decision. And uh, the next slide uh, deals with an overview of uh, the different uh, uh, crime categories uh, that uh, we are investigating. I think it will be observed that uh, there are different uh, uh, crime typologies mentioned on this slide. Uh, some of them are not necessarily matters reported by ESCOM. Those are, are some matters uh, which are get uh, linked, uh, for instance, to the investigation as we progress. An example would be the last one on the list there, which would be the contravention of the Disaster Management Act. Uh, the primary investigation focuses on fraud and uh, not necessarily uh, this act. But however, during the process of the investigation, uh, the same suspects uh, were then also charged uh, for contravening the Disaster Management Act. So it, the, the allegations ranges from theft of coal, theft of diesel, uh, and uh, there were also instances uh, a bomb uh, threats were, which were made and uh, the investigation had to be undertaken, tempering with uh, a critical infrastructure. And uh, the several as mentioned on the slide. Uh, we can then uh, move uh, to the overview of cases uh, on the court roll. Uh, currently, uh, matters that we have on the court roll, which is uh, the first case uh, on the slide, which would be uh, with Bank case 223 of 3, 2022. And uh, the offenses is possession of uh, suspected uh, stolen property. And uh, this is uh, a court matter. They accused uh, Mr. Vilagazi, uh, who was uh, the driver of uh, a truck, uh, had uh, to be arrested and charged uh, for the theft. And uh, the matter is appearing in court on 28 November 2022. And uh, further moving on, it's uh, a force man case 169 of 3 2022. And uh, the offenses under investigation is possession of aluminium conductor, uh, tempering with essential uh, infrastructure as uh, a second charge. And uh, this case uh, is also a matter that uh, it's before court. Uh, Tabi Somate uh, is expected to appear in court again on the same matter on 28 November 2022. And uh, moving further, also another court case. Uh, it's uh, uh, three case numbers. Uh, involved in this matter, Bedford View 345 of 8, 2017, Polar Case 123, Polar 124 of 3, 2019, and uh, Polar 125 of 3, 2019. In total, then there are five uh, cases. Uh, this uh, uh, involves uh, several uh, uh, accused persons, of which uh, uh, one of them is Mr. Sakuti. Uh, and uh, and uh, several, there's a company as well, uh, Toolbar Construction, and uh, several accused as they appear as well on the slide uh, that I have been charged uh, for the contravention of fraud, contravention of uh, the Prevention of Corrupt Activities Act, and uh, including also the Prevention of Organized uh, uh, Crimes Act. And uh, one should just mention that uh, in this particular matter, although it is a court matter, expected uh, to be before court on 4 November 2022, uh, there is still pending investigation on some of uh, uh, the cases. The, one would explain it in such a way that uh, it's different legs uh, of which uh, the current uh, court matters are not dependent on the outstanding investigations. So should the other investigations be finalized, we expect that uh, the same matters will then be presented uh, as well. Major uh, General, as if I may humbly request that we don't go through case by case and request colleagues that we take the schedule as read 
and enter it into the record of uh, the report that we will do, um, and then cover the salient points, the material salient points of each one uh, of the of the cases. So I don't think we need to go through them. What we wanted is that are the are the cases uh, receiving work. So if you can give a, a, an executive summary, but covering the salient points, those must not be lost. Um, and then take the full report of the schedule of cases as read and enter it into the record. Your colleagues are agreeable to that? Okay. Thanks, Major General. Can proceed. Okay. Thank you, Honorable Chairperson. Uh, well, uh, uh, one would then just uh, move uh, from the court cases, uh, having indicated that uh, all the court cases, this is where investigation has been finalized. And we are either expecting, uh, a, well, it's at different stages in court. Others are due for trial. Others, uh, the trial is already pending. And uh, as indicated in my earlier slide that uh, we had a total, I think it's 18 of those cases, which are all court cases. One would then move uh, to the overview of the cases uh, currently uh, under investigation. Now uh, we have uh, prepared a table there, uh, which uh, just uh, also it's uh, to an extent a bit of elaboration of uh, the type of uh, offenses that are being investigated. And uh, also uh, just to indicate uh, the extent of the investigation, I think there is the part that it's a bit hiding there, which uh, uh, shows that uh, there are 55. Uh, out of the 55 cases which uh, we have investigated, uh, we have an estimated uh, uh, value of about 365 uh, million involved. And also critical for us is just to indicate that 516 statements or affidavits have been obtained, which uh, uh, signifies uh, the effort put uh, to try and finalize uh, these matters. Uh, as speedily as possible. And then we have also slides, uh, Chairperson, that deals with the overview of cases uh, provisionally withdrawn. As uh, indicated earlier, one needs also to touch on these uh, cases because uh, one would uh, be having interest to say, why are the matters uh, uh, withdrawn? Some of these matters, uh, although I've jumped some of the cases, uh, accused persons uh, are arrested uh, uh, while there is uh, not yet sufficient evidence available and the prosecutors would ordinarily refuse to place uh, such a matter on the court roll pending us getting a, a sufficient evidence uh, that uh, would be sufficient for prosecution purposes. But the ones are highlighted uh, in the presentation uh, are these are matters that are currently with us being prioritized uh, to try and finalize the outstanding investigations so that we can return these cases back uh, to the prosecutors uh, for decision. I would uh, then uh, uh, not go case by case. Uh, I've indicated in my first slide, uh, Chairperson, that uh, there are seven of these matters uh, which are uh, individuals were arrested matters were before court and uh, provisionally withdrawn. Uh, that brings us uh, to the end of uh, the slides of provisionally uh, withdrawn matters. I will hand back to the national head. Thank you, Chairperson. Don't worry, Mayor General. If colleagues have got a matter on a specific case, they will refer to it in the question and answer session. So we'll come back to those as and when is necessary. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Chairperson, Honorable Members, uh, as the DPCI, we as said the Act provide that uh, we shall always uh, perform our work uh, without fear, favor, or prejudice, and there is commitment to deal uh, with these matters. So that uh, will conclude uh, the presentation. Chairperson, thank you very much. All right, thank you very much for that marathon set of presentations. The nice guy in me was considering a comfort break, but then the not so nice guy thinks, let's proceed. So, <laughs> so 
Uh, no, he's not here. He's on leave. Um, all right, colleagues, uh, we've had a full set of presentations. Um, let's take a five minute comfort break. Um, and then we will come back and then field questions. So colleague, five minutes now. I'm gonna come out with a glass then. I will think if you don't come back. All right, five minute comfort break, everybody. Thanks.
All right, colleagues, can we come to order, please? Can we come to, can we take our seats, please? So the, but soon there will be, I've got a flight, I've got uh, this, I've got uh, that. Tina, we are here till tomorrow. Got another four o'clock. Hmm? Yeah, well, at least there's no um, connection issues and buffering and please mute and oh, the headaches of online meetings. I hate that thing. All right, let us... Is everybody here? General Libya is here, Bukit Mtib is here, Chairs here, CEO, all right. All the people we need are here. All right. Colleagues, you've heard the story. Now you can probe it. Hands. Noel van Minen, be first off the bat. Can I proceed, Chair? Yeah? I've got a number of questions. Should I run through all of them or how do you want me to do them? Um, please run through all of them. Okay. And then when they're done with responses, you come back with follow-ups and then we move on to the next member. Okay, great. Um, right, from the top, it was three different presentations. I just want to say thank you very much. I think particularly to the SIU and also to the SIU for the work that you're doing. I think that it's it's very important. Um, the action plan on the state capture task team, I see it went to the DPE in July. Do we know when that action plan will be finalized? So we'll actually move forward. On the issue of the coal quality, now there are a couple of presentations that really looked at this. What would the, yeah, the, the question kind of shifted as, as the presentations went ahead. So, I mean, clearly this is an issue. There is now the testing of the coal quality that is taking place, how widespread is that testing? The the Hawks, the, yeah, the Hawks I think it was, or, or the SIU touched on the automatic real-time um, combustion testing. What is happening in that space? Because clearly there is an issue there. I think it was mentioned before when we were actually at Kusile, that it certainly seems that a number of the loads of coal almost get, well, get deliberately swapped out, debased, et cetera, because that really does become a massive issue. But linked to that, the issue of Sariti and Key Lager, I noted that because of the delays that have happened, a lot of that coal is now earmarked for export and a middling product will be delivered. So how would that affect issues, particularly considering the narrowing of the coal quality, but has also been an issue with that power station over the years? So we can just have a bit of unpacking about that. Then also with Kusile, how long is it envisaged that the temporary offloading facilities will last? Because I mean, certainly in government, temporary measures have a habit of becoming permanent. So what is really going to happen there? What's the redundancy period on that? Also, something I noticed with that was the comment about the financial health of the contractor. Is there potentially a problem with that contractor? Why is it being noted specifically? So that also would be, would be useful. The cost of repair to Unit 4 of Madupi, is that included in the $18.95 I got the impression that it was, but we just have clarity on that as well as the fires at Kusile, and it was mentioned that there have been two fires at Kusile in Unit 2 and Unit 5, is that, you, you know, you said there was no foul play, but is that potentially a design defect? What is one looking at in, in that regard? Then the FGD plant. Now, I know we certainly in the oversight had conversations about the effect on generation capacity at Kusile, what would the effect be on Mudupi in terms of before and, and after the construction of that plant? The SIU, I just 
Um, okay, the diesel procurement that was mentioned by the SIU, if we can maybe just unpack that, that was a very, very sparse slide. It was just the four contracts, if we could just find out what's going on there. Then in terms of the organized crime uh, that is taking place with, with some senior officials and employees at ESCOM, have you found that the lifestyle audits are making a difference with that? I mean, I'm not going to ask how you're managing to detect the whole sort of web of nepotism, but I'd just be interested in, in what you can tell us in that regard. With the hawks and the matters that have been provisionally withdrawn, and I see already that there's a knock-on effect with at least one of the individuals managing to evade summons. I mean, the risk of provisionally withdrawing is exactly that. Um, and I understand it's because there's further investigation, but but why is that sort of vicious cycle happening that things are moving ahead, charges are laid, they're then provisionally withdrawn to do further investigation. I mean, there seems to be a problem in that chain. Then also with the theft of coal, of, of a number of things, it seems to be very much linked to the transport network and the transport system. Is there anything that can be done specifically about that? I mean, I understand that it's thousands of vehicles moving all over the country, but it certainly seems to be a common denominator in that space. I then also got two questions that weren't covered today. I know it is a bit of a flyer, but I'm, I'm going to ask them anyway. It's been in the media, the issue with Babcock. I know that the judgment is currently reserved. What is happening there? How did it develop? Because if it is true that ESCOM already had the welding certificate, it would be interesting to, to unpack that. And then the last question, I suppose my interest is that I, I live in the Greater Cape Town environs, and I'd actually like to stay living in the Greater Cape Town environs, with Kuburg, the life expansion project. Now, in 2010, that was estimated at 20 billion. In 2022, with all the changes that have happened, including the exchange rate, what costs is one looking at and what kind of time period is, is being discussed? Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So let's get responses to that set of questions and then Honorable Van Moon conclude and then we'll move on to the next member. So you will pose your questions as a set and then you will come back if they leave anything out. Right. Responses to Honorable Van Minen. Uh, Chair, with your permission, I'll direct questions to my colleagues as appropriate. Um, Mel, if you can just assist on the action plan and the response uh, expected from DPE on state capture. Thank you, Andre. Um, so currently, the state capture implementation plan is a live document, and the next version of the document is due for submission to DPE tomorrow. DPE's intention is to collate uh, submissions from various SOEs and make a submission to the presidency by the end of October. We are on track to finalize our submission and submit tomorrow. Um, Chair, through you, we have done a significant amount of work following the submissions made, by, recommendations made by Ju Judge Sando, uh, primarily around the supplier review space, the IR space, and governance in terms of internal policies and procedures. We are looking at streamlining and making the supplier review process more efficient and easier for ESCOM to take action against delinquent suppliers. Same applies to um, the IR processes. There is an area where we have made significant development and that relates to director delinquency. So through DPE, we're working with other SOEs to take action against uh, delinquent directors identified by Zondo. The groundwork on that has been done and, and it's basically in the hands of DPE to take it forward. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mel. Uh, Honourable Chair, through you, if I can respond on the coal quality issue. Um, we are uh, trying to significantly improve our coal quality testing at the station. The current system works uh, by testing uh, coal at the mine and then having a certified stockpile at the mine. That stockpile is then loaded onto trucks. The truck is then sealed with a tarpaulin, and there's a seal affixed to prevent tampering. There's also um, a tracking device fitted to the vehicle. 
Now, what we've subsequently discovered is that there is significant tampering with the seals. Uh, there are jammers that are deployed to prevent the tracking unit from being used. Um, the coal trucks are then taken while they're off the radar, so to speak, to um, sites where the good quality coal is swapped out for discard coal, to just put that into context, uh, instead of 18 megajoule per kilogram, we get seven to eight. So it's really discard coal, uh, which is the, the portion of the coal that is left after the middlings and the export fraction uh, have been utilized. And uh, I think as Advocate Matibi pointed out, this has a very negative impact also on our mills, on our boiler tubes. So the knock-on effects are uh, very significant. Uh, it's a challenge to do real-time testing at the power station because you are, um, you've got trucks offloading on a continuous basis. When, when you have a queue of trucks, uh, time is money and you don't have time to sterilize a truck um, based on um, a full laboratory analysis. So what we are doing, we are um, conducting work on a, a containerized auger sampler. So the auger will effectively take a sample from the truck and in real time, give us a representative indication what the calorific value the, and the ash content are. That will then have a automatic traffic light system attached to it, which will direct the truck uh, either to um, a, very similar to a parking garage where if you haven't paid your ticket, you are diverted and you have to be uh, quarantined and um, you will need to be inspected. Uh, we think that that will significantly improve our ability to control the quality of coal that we receive. Ultimately, though, for Kusile, in my opinion, the answer is to migrate as much as possible of our coal supply away from road onto uh, rail and conveyor belt, because the opportunities for tampering and diversion just are uh, far less. Um, and and uh, this is something that is also contained in our shareholder compact. It is measured as a target by DPE. Uh, so, so we um, are aligned with our shareholder uh, on that. As far as the specifications for new Largo uh, are concerned, the coal will meet the, the ESCOM so-called 240 spec. So we, we, are, we are comfortable with, with the middling product. And in fact, this is the system that has been in use um, historically for uh, ESCOM linked mines uh, for many decades. Um, Jan, maybe I can ask you to please refer to the uh, temporary offloading facilities as well as the uh, repairs of Unit 4 and then Unit 2 and 6 at Kusile. Uh, any design defects, please, Jan. Thank you, Andre. Honorable Chair and Honorable Member. There are quite a few things. Uh, I'll go through it as I've got it here. Temporary. We see temporary as not later than the first quarter of 2024. So the aim is to have everything done by the end of the calendar year, but we have given another quarter. We need to understand, or we understand now that should there be six units be in commercial operation and online, if we continue with the current um, logistical situation that we have, we talk about a truck every 54 seconds, which is impossible. So we have to deal with it as soon as possible. So it is important to understand that. Um, the Sariti contract that we've signed uh, a few weeks ago, and then the commitment received from Sariti for the additional offloading facility, that will take us anything between, I would say, 15 and 18 months. So again, this additional 4 million tons per annum we um, believe it will be online by that first quarter of 2024. Now, in terms of the, temp uh, fi uh, the permanent solution, again, the plans are for the end calendar year of 2023. So we will do whatever we need to, to make sure this uh, coal facility is ready. Um, 
the question on the supplier, the financial health of the supplier. Again, because of national treasury rules and regulations, at the time we had to choose and select this uh, contractor. Now, a week, two weeks ago, the contractor already approached us because of cash flow problems on that side, paying subcontractors. So based on that, we've made a decision that we will go to the tender committee next week to have our plan B and to have another contractor already identified, negotiate, should something happen. Because we cannot at all afford to miss this, uh, this period. Over and above this, and I don't want to go and elaborate on this, we have similar challenges on the ash situation as well. So it's not only getting the coal in, it's to getting the ash out. It's very similar challenges that we do have. Um, in terms of Kusile Medupi 4, that cost is not part of CAPEX because that unit's been placed into commercial operations. So that is operating and maintenance, but Caleb can talk about that. That will be an insurance claim. So to be paid by the insurance. Similar to the gas air heater incident. That is still on the contractor side, so it has no impact. The only impact, as I mentioned in the beginning, was the interest during construction. And should there be additional uh, interest during construction, that will be a commercial interaction with the contractor concerned. Because we haven't identified yet the root cause of this fire and this unit fire gas air heater, we cannot say is it similar to what happened in uh, at, at uh, unit number two. Unit number two, we've identified as a fuel oil that caused the fire and that, uh, so we haven't identified that yet. Do we at this point in time believe it may be a design error? No, we don't think so. So this is where we find ourselves. Now, in terms of the FGD, with the challenges we have, we're very close now to finalize a contract with the OBM to do the operating and maintenance, and then also to have spares available to get this plant to operate the way it's supposed to. We had interactions with uh, General Electric, which installed the plant, and we said that we need to sit as teams around the table to look if there may be any design challenges that we do have. They're very open to that. I've spoken to the ESCOM teams as well, so we will get together and now assess where we are. Because we have to make sure that we we know that that if should there be any, any modifications needed, that we need to implement it now, because as you correctly said, if we built the same plant at Medupi, it doesn't help you know that you have the same challenges there, because Medupi is performing extremely well. So it doesn't help that you're going to uh, install a new plant and you have similar problems. Um, then in terms of Kuburg, I think that was the last one that I've picked up. Um, at, at the time, it was 20 billion. The cost is still 20 billion, but obviously time has passed. So the value of time needs to be taken into consideration. Um, will we be ready? I believe we will be ready. Um, the first unit uh, to the, for the steam generators to be replaced uh, will be the breaker will open on unit number one. Currently, the date is 8th of December, so we, we're going to try and, and, and make sure it is 8th of December. That's going to take us anything between 20, 200 and 220 days. So we will replace the steam generators, and then in about August next year, we will take unit number two off, and we'll install the three steam generators in there as well. It is, it's posing a significant challenge to us because we don't have Ahmedou uh, P4, that is 720 megawatts. Then we're going to have a 920 megawatts, not available for nearly a year and a half because of the two Kuburg units. So it is posing a challenge. We are seeing how we're going to deal with the production uh, plan in terms of uh, making sure that we reduce the risk of load shedding to a minimum. But this is where we are. However, are we confident that we're going to be able to successfully achieve the extension and the life extension, the license in the middle of 2024? Yes, we are. Thank you. I think there was questions for the SIU. Yes, that's correct. Yes, indeed. Yeah. And Eskom, are you done? Yeah, I think the final question was relating to Babcock. Yes. Uh, the 
the matter is uh, currently before the court, so, so I, I need to be a little careful, but I think as a general matter of principle, um, for any bid to assume that ESCOM knows that you have certain capabilities or that you are tax compliant or BE compliant or whatever the case may be, um, introduces a, a whole new area for uh, risk to be introduced into the tendering system. We've got a checklist that you have to comply with that you need to demonstrate on each and every tender, even though we know that you are BE compliant. If you submit a new bid, you need to submit your certificate again. Because if you don't, and subsequently it turns out that there was a problem, then of course the, the whole process becomes undermined. So from a procurement perspective, when we when we go through these documents, we 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 don't say but 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 we know. We say, is it there? Is it checked? Is it verified? Is it submitted? So without wanting to make any statement on the merits of this particular case, we have to be scrupulous in adjudicating each and every tender on the documents that are submitted there and then. And that's uh let me let me stop there. Thank you. Okay. So you Thank you, Honorable Chair, uh, Honorable Members. Uh, Honorable Van Minen, I'll deal with the issue relating to lifestyle audits, and then uh, my colleague will deal with the diesel contracts in terms of the details around the investigation. Have we found that lifestyle audits are making a difference? The answer is yes, in the following manner. Uh, if the lifestyle uh, assessment or lifestyle audit is consistently applied. Uh, and of course, at all levels that are identified, these assessments, uh, stroke audits, are able to give us risk indicators that would then require further, further action or further investigation. Uh, in some instances, uh, we have found uh, what we could refer to as unexplained wealth. Uh, and, and uh, of course, that's the, the, um, the actually is it possessions vis-a-vis -vis income and how is it that it's explained. Uh, and that would then again become an indicator that we need to look at further. Uh, we conduct extensive uh, financial analysis uh, going through, of course, the flow of money, um, uh, that would indicate uh, where the monies uh, come from, and we are able to look if it comes from suppliers, uh, what would be the rationale and the reason for that. So overall, overall, uh, the lifestyle assessments are able to assist us in, uh, in, in pointing us in directions where we need to investigate. And they've actually even assisted uh, and enabled us to point to involvement in certain contracts. Uh, and we were able then to you know, investigate further and then either link to criminal uh, uh, actions. So overall, the uh, lifestyle uh, assessments, lifestyle audits really do, do assist. And we'd like to see that uh, implemented uh, and we have been vocal as well in terms of these being implemented even uh, in public sector wide, public service uh, uh, or in other state owned entities. Because this is uh, this is a helpful uh, one of the helpful mechanisms, as I say, to raise uh, red flags or indicators that would require us to uh, check further and investigate further. Thank you. I'll ask my colleagues uh, to deal with the diesel contracts. Thanks. Thank you, Honorable Chair and Honorable, Honorable Members. Um, in relation to the diesel contracts, the investigation is fo focused on the following. The spend on diesel contributed to severe financial challenges over the time. What we found is that um, services were procured from suppliers which were not well established that pointed to a weakness in a due diligence that could have been um, executed at contract placement stages to determine whether the contractor themselves was in the position of supplying the required quantities. 
There's also allegations of possible fronting where we have instances where the, uh, the, the contractor uh, prior experience was not in this industry. And now suddenly they're given multi-million rand or hundreds of millions of rands worth of contracts to supply. Uh, there's also a possible um, involvement of employees in the establishment of the suppliers. The irregular and inappropriate uh, inclusion of intermediaries in the transactions. Uh, and we found that to be problematic, very similar to what we find in uh, all of the business units um, within ESCOM, where we find that coming back to the conflict of interest cases where ESCOM employees will find a niche way of trying to get one of their preferred suppliers into the market, either not through a direct main contract, but as a subcontractor or an intermediary. Um, we also looked at the possible irregular procurement practices and the possible cover coating. Um, we also found instances of payments exceeding the purchase orders. Uh, and we're looking at those extensions and the variations. We also found that there's probably a failure to maximize the buying power of ESCOM in relation to the various escalations um, on a scale of economies uh, based on the projected values or quantities that could have been required. Um, there might have been a possibility to negotiate rates at an early date. Uh, so the, the rates that was actually negotiated was based on a fixed term. Uh, but we all know that those rates have, have, uh, could have been negotiated based on the extensions that subsequently came through. So all of that, um, Honorable Member, we are looking at uh, in our investigation. They are not necessarily consistent on all of four of these matters, but they run through all, all four of them. These four matters are the matters that have commenced so far, and they are not all the matters that we will be investigating. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Hawks, there was a matter on the withdrawn cases. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Chair and Honorable Members. Uh, the two questions relating to the Hawks, the first one of uh, the uh, provisionally uh, withdrawn matters. Um, when one look at the matters that have been provisionally uh, withdrawn, one will observe that uh, the timeline on which uh, the matters were reported up to now is uh, since 2018 to 2021. And the reasons why uh, the cases will be withdrawn is that uh, in our way of investigation, there are those matters that uh, we disrupt, not uh, go through the normal way of investigation, but uh, you quickly have to deal with that matter there and then and confuse the situation. So then, when you do that, you find that uh, there are alibis that are now being raised by the individuals that uh, you shall have arrested. As an example, one will, will see where we find that there are people who are uh, having dispensing machines to generate electricity. And when you get them, they will be indicating that they are just the runners. They are running for somebody else. And again, you find that uh, now you have got a machine, you need to investigate now what have this machine generated. So it requires more investigation than just to deal with the position of that uh, instrument. So it's the alibi at times that uh, you need to be uh, following. Some of them you'll find that uh, they are driving a, a, a car with uh, coal and the like, but this is stolen. And then that individual now starts saying that I'm just a driver, so do you charge this one alone or you have to investigate further? So we take the directives from the uh, public prosecutor that no, in order to deal with this matter properly, go and conduct the following investigation. So the matters uh, become part of the investigation so that uh, we comply with those. And then, uh, as it can be seen in some of them, uh, when the investigation is completed, usually uh, you do not necessarily go and effect arrest. Sometimes you find that uh, you now need to serve summons. In one of these matters, summons have now been issued and it appears that the suspect is now uh, evading the service. So we might obviously have to be changing to go into the uh, area of uh, warrant and then uh, 
circulation and publication of the individual. So that, that is uh, the, some of the reasons why these matters uh, have been temporarily uh, withdrawn. Uh, the second question uh, that talks to the uh, theft of coal, uh, what we can indicate is that indeed this is not a standalone. It is related to other matters. Uh, we haven't unpacked the nature of the investigation that uh, we are doing. Some of this investigation are unconventional in nature. Uh, there, there are still some activities that are uh, taking place in that regard. And uh, obviously there are also some uh, intimidatory processes in the matters that uh, we are dealing with. So yes, indeed it is not uh, just an ordinary theft. Uh, there are other individuals that are sitting elsewhere that uh, we are working on with, with the intelligence community to try to see how then do we produce evidence to link a group, not an individual. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Thank you very much for those responses. And with Anuna, you're fine. My only request is with the responses, can we be pointed? Because all the members have got questions. So, um, all right, Honorable Van Minen. Got a couple of follow-ups. I can hold them over or I can just deal with them now. They're not long. No, finish off your okay. section and then we'll go to the next Okay, colleague. great. It's still an issue of coal. I didn't get the name of the of the unit that you were talking about um, that can then actually go in real time and, and remove it and, and test the coal. What would the cost of something like that be? And the reason I want to follow up on that is I remember when we were on site something about um, there was a shortage of finances to build the conveyor belts. That was a that was a challenge at one point. Would that be a challenge with with this kind of unit? Then also and linked to to what the Hawks were saying. I mean, people presumably wouldn't be stealing items if there wasn't a market for it. Now, particularly with coal, you're not talking about a couple of bags. I mean, you're talking about you know what you're saying essentially hundreds of truckloads. I mean, what is happening? Presumably, there's a channel for that to be what exported, sold on. I mean, what, what is happening in that space? And then, then just lastly, with Kuberg, what would be the updated 2022 price given the differences with time and exchange rate and everything? And also, given that the Western Cape is at a, a relative distance from the rest of the the power grid, would there be any particular issues in the Western Cape with outages vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the country? Because I mean, there are already challenges in that regard. And losing generation from Kuburg is certainly something that would be a risk here. Thanks. Thank you very much. All right, let's get responses to those. All right, Honorable Chair, the, the uh, technology that we are investigating is an auger. So it looks like a, a big screw, essentially, that will go into the coal and extract a sample, which can then be analyzed, uh, essentially in real time. Uh, we don't have a cost yet what it would be because we are in the procurement process right now. So we, as soon as that is concluded, we will know. What happens with the coal? The coal gets exported. Uh, the, for the equivalent coal that um, ESCOM buys, you can get three times on the export market uh, due to the war in Ukraine. And uh, there's, a, there's a lively arbitrage market going on. Uh, if you drive on the N4, you can see kilometers of trucks going uh, through to Mozambique for coal exports uh, through Matola. We've uh, seen uh, coal trucks as far north as the DRC. Uh, so there's a, there's, a, there's a big market for the coal that should come to ESCOM and that we pay for. Jan, can you handle Kubok? Thank you. Um, honorable Chair and Honorable Member, um, I don't have the exact figure for the uh, the cost. I will let you have it. I'll have it on Friday, actually. So uh, I'll, I'll make it available that it can be distributed. And then on the network, or oh, the impact uh, of that 920 megawatts that will not be available, the South African grid is integrated. So we will then supply power from, say, Mapumalanga or wherever it is, and then just route it down to to, uh, to the Western Cape. So, because that's a luxury of having an integrated transmission network. So you can then send your electrons wherever you need it and wherever it's needed. So it's not going to impact because a 920 is off for a year 
and a half or year year and a half that it's going to impact now specifically the Western Cape. No, not at all. Right. Thank you very much, colleagues. Right, Honourable Samia. But well, thank you very much, uh, uh, Chairperson, and uh, good good afternoon, uh, Deputy Minister, the Chair of the Board, and the uh, and the team, the CEO, um, the head of unit, and uh, uh, the head for um, serious crime investigations. The reports that you have given us uh, today are mind-boggling. Uh, whether it uh, um, starts with uh, what you have received in terms of your operational capability and uh, practical uh, experience which follows that thereof. <clears throat> We've been at the uh, ESCOM uh, various points uh, of transmission and, and, and the recent visit that we had there has exposed um, a number of uh, areas for, for attention and uh, through those engagements that we had at the head office. Um, one, one area which I asked and I continue to ask is, is uh, your, 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 your current ability uh, to confirm the availability um, uh, of energy. And, and that availability measure, uh, which sought to guarantee to the nation that, that the standard generating practice could allow a particular uh, measure, which uh, predictable says to us, if we maintain uh, our infrastructure uh, consistently, uh, the feed would be um, uh, in the standing of so much, and if uh, adding to the current failures, uh, therefore the deficit uh, to that would be uh, somewhat so much. Uh, so that, uh, uh, that uh, sort of a measure and a guarantee uh, begins to create predictability of your system and uh, uh, together between uh, the executive and, and, and the board, uh, there is a, some form of a, a standard frame uh, of operation, which gives into uh, the performance expectation um, of, of ESCOM in general. Uh, what is it that now uh, you could uh, be able to give as per your standard, uh, which frames your strategy in general um, as to if you operate in the maximal form, um, if we, operate under the current um, uh, situation, the scenario stands at this at this level. Uh, if you could uh, probably be able to give us that kind uh, of an indication. And, and uh, we, we follow the cost to it, uh, uh, you see. And of course, if you follow those costs, you listen to the investigations which are taking place. Uh, and if you're listening to SIU, uh, the internal, uh, a breakage of ethical um, uh, operations uh, in as far as the, uh, the internal environment is concerned, it, it really takes away that hope. Uh, and, and you say uh, that uh, it's, it's now it's not necessarily the non-availability uh, of a fiscal support, but there's a seepage, uh, uh, you see, of such, uh, which is unbearably uh, uh, exposes uh, that uh, weakness generally in the ESCOM's operations. And, and what we have been given by SIU begins to give uh, that kind of an indication. Uh, more than 5,000 um, officials who have failed to uh, declare and through those failures you would identify certain individuals who are deep in business. Um, uh, you see, with ESCOM, though you have the policy, uh, which is indicative of what is being uh, acceptable, not acceptable around that range. So, so uh, uh, the situation is somewhat dire. 
and, and you find a sense of wanting to say, these standards become so pervasive. Uh, you know, you want to meet this form, you want to operate within uh, this kind of a route, and, and it's really pervasive. Uh, you know, uh, you don't find time to get there um, uh, anymore. And, and we, we, we need as a nation that kind of, a, of, an, of an undertaking, looking into the scale and scope uh, of those uh, kinds of investigations. Which, which that brings me to the, another uh, question, which relates to the fact that when we visited these, these power stations, there was an indication uh, of a lack of stability um, on the sense of the numbers of your employees, uh, whether was it the movement from this area to that area and so forth. So I would want to check uh, so far on the operational unit, um, uh, you see in sense of operations where things uh, are somewhat uh, a bit harsher uh, in, the, in the environment. Since we're there, uh, what is the current standing in terms of your executives, your uh, actual managers in terms of uh, expected uh, levels of your employee uh, in your human resources and the, um, the availability of such a capital uh, skilled individuals to face uh, the current the current ch ch challenges. If, if you could have that kind of uh, uh, indication out there, um, because that, that goes with a cost uh, into these kinds of breakages. You bring in new people to get into this environment and you leave out those have been there, the stability which affects uh, the current operational ability in as far as, as com uh, is concerned. And, and uh, the, third, the third area um, uh, relates to the stockpiles. Uh, uh, when we're there, uh, I remember that um, there were millions of tons uh, on stock, um, which would from time to time, uh, you would find a, a caterpillar, uh, you see, which would run through it uh, and trying to level things uh, in a way. So it, it means there's a cost into uh, the storage, a cost into receipt, uh, and uh, the pile itself actively eats into uh, ESCOM's uh, capability. Uh, one way or the other, though though now I accept and I appreciate the fact that uh, you are seeking to uh, real time uh, to evaluate uh, the quality uh, of your code, uh, which uh, gets into your, your own areas. Have you resolved uh, that uh, pie, its own availability? Uh, the, I think it was going to something like 18 million uh, tons, was it 14, uh, 14 million, uh, 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 you see, million uh, tons at the time? And, and what is the uh, current standing uh, with what you have available uh, to deal with these uh, uh, kinds of issues, uh, uh, you know? Uh, and uh, then, then the take or pay uh, scenario, uh, uh, you know, uh, based on the challenge you're saying here. Uh, financially, you uh, have a liability of 9.7 billion rand uh, per year. Uh, in as far as uh, uh, that that uh, challenge is concerned, I appreciate that you are engaged in negotiations uh, to try to uh, deal uh, uh, with it. Um, what 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 else could be done uh, to deal with this? Because the the financial capability. Uh, of, of, of the entity is somewhat being weakened uh, by a number of policy drives uh, which are in the internal reach uh, out there, even before you could ask for the external support uh, in as far as the a financial uh, capability is, uh, is, is concerned. So dealing with this uh, becomes one issue uh, at point. Uh, the uh, other things, I think you've spoken about that uh, CO, the Gibson factor, uh, how uh, you are trying to find a solution. But you are saying that uh, your target is by, is by October, by October this year. 
they were in, sitting in October. And if we're sitting in October, is there any site of finding solution uh, to that as we speak, uh, so that uh, uh, we have uh, some kind of a guarantee uh, on, uh, uh, on, 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 on such. The, the, another worrisome uh, aspect, though I've heard you, that any problem which lead to breakage, current breakage, while we are talking about commercialization uh, of these uh, 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 units, the performance of these uh, uh, power uh, stations, uh, Kusile uh, being uh, in attention uh, uh, currently, the breakages, uh, the liability goes to uh, uh, those who are insurers um, uh, one way or the other. And uh, therefore there's no expectation uh, for yourselves to be worried that much. Is, is, is that a fact uh, that uh, uh, you, you are not necessarily uh, that much worried when there are such um, occurrences uh, in as far as the breakage uh, of uh, such a, um, a unit operations uh, uh, in a way? If, if, if uh, yes, um, uh, the figures uh, in, in terms of your commitment around uh, the finalization of your work on construction uh, of those still stand. Uh, you, you affirm uh, into that there will be no additional costs uh, to fiscus uh, in as far as, a, as such is concerned. There can be a confirmation, though the worrisome area is that there is an elasticity in as far as the finality uh, of such construction uh, as it relates to uh, the units themselves. The second last point, uh, Chair, it relates, uh, relates to what you have told us on the uh, gas uh, desulfurization. Uh, uh, you know, that has been the point when we were there uh, the last time. It has been a point when we were there earlier on. It, it looks like uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an area which you find most difficulty um, uh, on. Is, is there no way uh, that you could uh, uh, find a lasting solution? Because the problem that you have there, it creates uh, uh, some undertaking that we must put aside money to deal with this. It's, it's a problem which is going to exist over time. And therefore uh, we must uh, 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 somewhat uh, uh, find money to deal with this defect uh, 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 in a way. Uh, so so uh, on your R&D, uh, is, there, is there a way that you could uh, find a form uh, of assistance to deal with this kind of a problem? Uh, because it has been there over time. We're there in like 2020 and so forth. The last question is the question that relates to what we have seen uh, on uh, matters uh, of uh, uh, payments. In appreciation uh, that uh, ABB uh, uh, has uh, seen uh, indicatively an amount of about 1.5 billion rand, uh, which has been finalized there. And uh, According to what you reported to us, I think around 2020, uh, the situation was standing at 1 billion rand as an additional of 500 uh, and above uh, uh, billion rands uh, there. Um, the, is the, the actual result of such was the specific, specific reference was of uh, 1 billion rand at your report at June 2020. Uh, and uh, there were others which were listed, I think about four uh, of those uh, which were listed, um, which uh, uh, end up to about four, four billion rand uh, loss. Uh, but in terms of this current report here, you carry to us ABB. Uh, what is happening with others? Uh, where are they? Uh, uh, what is actually taking place uh, in terms of following uh, these uh, uh, kinds of payments, uh, uh, you know, because uh, it looks like it's a loss which is a bit coverable. What 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 else can be done uh, uh, on such uh, uh, instances? Uh, thanks for 
your summary in terms of uh, your report in the conclusion, uh, which makes a, a very valuable analytics uh, on uh, what is uh, the actual uh, deliverables uh, on, on what you are uh, investigating uh, out there. But if we can take that uh, and align it with a system, it would, it would bring something which I would say, uh, note, note three uh, of 2021, 2022 uh, gives, uh, uh, you see, one very worrisome picture, uh, you see, because you give, you give a right and, and you give that right uh, into the litany uh, of, uh, of problems, uh, uh, you know, which leads to uh, free for all uh, on these matters of procurement. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a good intent, uh, but it's a good intent you give it to the, the hands that handle it. Uh, you worry that uh, it's a house uh, are getting a useful instrument which could be peddled and uh, form up uh, to be uh, a bloody problematic uh, instance. So uh, how uh, do we seek to do it? Maybe uh, welcome, Sisi, uh, for uh, you to be here. Uh, she, she's, uh, she's in the part of the procurement head uh, of, of National Treasury. So, so these things are the things that uh, then begin to uh, have uh, us worried as to how can we better the handling of that uh, food instrument so that the results and the outcomes there give the intended uh, outcome uh, based on the objective which has been uh, handed out. So thank you very much, Chair. Thank you very much, Honorable. Um, let's get responses to um, that set of questions. Um, and then, uh, okay, Honorable uh, Lise and Honorable Hatebe, Honorable Bukes, and then we'll close it off with Amdulash. All right, Honorable Mint will close it off for us. Isola Kulgushogong. <laughs> yes, to you. Thank you very much, uh, Honourable Chair and Honourable Member. Thank you for those questions. Um, the ESCOM generation system is at this point uh, not reliable and not predictable, and hence we have intermittent load shedding. Um, it's important to take into account that we have 81 units and those 81 units uh, perform to different capacities at different times. Now, um, what this means is that with a very high degree of certainty, you ask for a guarantee, uh, which, which is always a dangerous thing uh, to give, um, but with, with a very high degree of certainty, we can say that at any given point in time, there will be at least 25,000 megawatts available. But that does not mean that it's the same number of units available all the time, because units are taken off for planned maintenance, other units break um, in, a, in an unplanned manner, and they therefore need to be repaired. So there is always a certain percentage of our units that are at risk. So we keep on operating them because there they are known risks uh, where, where we are aware that there are challenges that could lead to those units going offline at any time, but we are still able to continue operating the unit. But those risks could manifest at any point in time. So on average, on a daily basis, I would put that number at about 5,000 megawatts of uh, units that are at risk. Now, should those units, uh, should those errors manifest themselves, then of course, we, we have a shortfall in generation capacity. And that then leads to the necessity for load shedding to have to be um, introduced. Uh, where we are right now is that we have um, approximately 15,000 megawatts right now uh, out on unplanned maintenance and about 5,500 megawatts out on planned maintenance. Now, if you take that planned maintenance number as a percentage of our overall installed capacity, you will see that it's a very high percentage. Uh, and it's certainly much higher than prevailed um, 
in the days when the mantra was ninety uh, percent um, EAF, seven uh, percent planned maintenance, three percent unplanned maintenance. That that was in ESCOM's heyday. Um, today we we are having to do far more planned maintenance in order to catch up. And of course, if you in the past deferred maintenance, the extent to which you then have to carry out plan maintenance is so much greater than if you had kept to the scheduled outages as they were originally intended to be performed. And, and that is why we are having to play catch up when it comes to plan maintenance. We have, as ESCOM management, consistently signaled over the past three years that there's a generation capacity shortfall of between four and six gigawatts. And this is a message that I think is now generally accepted. Uh, everyone understands that, that we need new generation capacity to be added to the grid. The IPP office in the uh, Department of Mineral Resources and Energy uh, are uh, procuring new electricity. Uh, we are ourselves procuring electricity uh, from neighboring countries, but also from uh, producers that have capacity available on the grid right now that they could dispatch to us. Um, but fundamentally, uh, Honorable Chair, what we need to do is we need to improve the reliability of our current coal fleet. And part of that improvement initiative is to, um, first of all, uh, fix the variables that are under our control, uh, predominantly coal and coal quality. And this is where the work of the Hawks and the SIU is very important to assist us in, in enabling us to, to get a grip on uh, coal, particularly the coal delivered uh, by road. We also need uh, time. Uh, catching up on maintenance uh, takes a very long time. Uh, and we also need money. Uh, doing these outages uh, take uh, a lot of money and we need to place uh, orders for long lead items significantly in advance. Unfortunately, our uh, chief financial officer to my left here has made available money to fund those, those outages so that we can procure uh, the, the needed spares in good time. Uh, so until such time as there is substantial new generation capacity added to the grid, the risk of load shedding will uh, be there. Now, if you look at what the president's announced um, on the 25th of July with the National Electricity Crisis Committee being established uh, and the lifting of the cap on own or embedded generation, uh, we are aware that um, there are at least 6,000 megawatts already in the pipeline of projects being registered with NOSA. This will take uh, between 18 and 24 months to come online, and that will play a significant role in abating the risk of load shedding going forward. So I think the right uh, moves have been made, uh, but now it takes time to implement. You can't, um, unfortunately, conjure up generation capacity out of nowhere. It, it takes time to be added to the grid. Um, the uh, impact of the issues um, that have been raised by the SIU and the Hawks, they, they are very serious. Um, where you have uh, entrenched criminal networks operating uh, in your generation system, it does create significant challenges uh, in terms of quality of coal, availability of spares. Um, if spares are um, procured in a fraudulent manner and never delivered, uh, your system will tell you that the spare is in the store, but actually it isn't there because it was never delivered in the first place. It was paid for, but it wasn't delivered. Um, so therefore, um, I really welcome the uh, increased attention from the SIU, but also particularly from the Hawks in getting to grips with uh, the criminal networks that are still operating uh, inside ESCOM and that have a very significant negative impact on our ability to operate the entity uh, as, as we want. Uh, just to use a metaphor, it's very difficult for a, for a fish to swim in a toxic stream. So we need to clean up the stream uh, if we want this fish to, to swim. In terms of the stability of staff, um, we, uh, we, I think, have very good um, 
people, very highly qualified people, but where we have fallen down is to continue to invest in training <laughs> on a continuous basis. Um, for reasons that um, unfortunately aren't known to current management, at some stage, ESCOM uh, stopped doing the training required. The ESCOM Academy of Learning, which is a world-class institution, was a world-class institution, was, was really uh, left to um, find its own way, and it did not receive the necessary uh, support. And many of the courses that had been presented there were unfortunately um, left to fall by the wayside. We are now rejuvenating the ESCOM Academy of Learning. We've got uh, a, an attempt to recruit new faculty, We've got a new general manager, Becky Malloy, who's been appointed to head that up. She is very energetic, very engaged, uh, and, and we are really wanting to restore this uh, crucial entity to ensure that we have a pipeline of employees that uh, we can continuously feed in order to ensure that we have the necessary uh, skills available. I may just also say that um, ESCOM employees um, are highly sought after in the external market, not only operational people, but also some of our functional employees, whether they be lawyers or, or finance people. And therefore, we, uh, we do have um, poaching going on also by international companies and international entities, in particular, uh, some of our nuclear schools, for example, have been um, attracted to go and work in the United Arab Emirates uh, with very, very lucrative packages that we are unable to match. So we do operate in a market where we have to uh, offer um, careers to people that will satisfy their aspirations. Um, and and therefore, we, we have a, a challenge in that regard. Uh, the stockpile management at Madupi, uh, the monthly cost of operating, you referred to the to the yellow caterpillars that you saw at site there, that costs about 14 million rand a month to, to operate that. Um, and the reason is that you that you have to maintain the stockpile. You can't just leave it. It would otherwise be subject to uh, spontaneous combustion, which of course you want to avoid um, at all costs. So you, so you do need to maintain that stockpile. As we indicated in our presentation, we, we are now consuming the requisite quantity of coal, so there are no more take or pay penalties being added. But if we, for some reason, again, uh, fall below the take or pay limit, then that contractual mechanism kicks in again. So the answer is that we need to operate Madupi as it should operate. And I think as the COO has indicated, um, barring unit four, which is out of commission at the moment due to that hydrogen explosion, we see an energy availability factor at Madupi of 85%, which is really very good. And we're very happy now that uh, the bulk of the design defects have been addressed. Um, the uh, units at uh, Kusile, yes, it is, a, it is a concern. I think what we've done with the introduction of flue gas desulfurization is at, at Kusile, we've introduced a single point of failure. Uh, and we've introduced a single point of failure through a technology which, in retrospect, was not well known to ESCOM and where we did not have the requisite skill to, to operate those, those FGD units. As the COO has intimated, we have therefore engaged with General Electric, who was the supplier of these units, to give us support to ensure that we can... Uh, be convinced that there are no design defects in those FGD units uh, and that we can um, improve the risk that is introduced by these FGD units to the operation at Kusile. Um, it is really the major reason why Kusile is not performing at similar EAF levels as Madupi. Um, and if I may just add, uh, the, the introduction of FGD at Madupi uh, potentially could introduce a similar single point of failure. Uh, so therefore, we, we really need to think very carefully about how we engineer out those risks and make sure that we have the adequate skills available prior to the FGD plant being uh, commissioned. And hence, we also want to go out for an operation and maintenance contract for the FGD rather than... than doing it ourselves necessarily. 
Um, the 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 lasting solution that you refer to therefore really relates to um, how can we get um, the requisite skill and run those units as they as they should be run. Uh, the matter with regard to ABB, uh, if I recall correctly, it was on the 22nd of December 2020 uh, that ABB paid to ESCOM an amount of 1.577 billion. Uh, ABB self-reported, which makes uh, it a, a different matter to some of the other matters where the alleged perpetrators are denying any liability. So the burden of proof uh, that we have to discharge is significantly greater because it, it is an adversarial process rather than a negotiation where the one party has already admitted wrongdoing and it's now a matter of negotiating what the amount of damages will be. Uh, as was indicated in the slides, we are pursuing uh, actions against uh, Stefan Udi Stocks, against uh, Tenova, um, and others who are involved in these alleged overpayments with a view to uh, recovering them. And this is where, again, we, we uh, cooperate very closely with the SIU to ensure that we can recover those costs. Thank you, Honorable Chair. Thank you very much, Tenova uh, Sommer. Am I fine? The operation um, in terms of the staff. Um, there was a question which was raised um, when we were there that, that in, in terms of predictability of uh, staff uh, availability in the units, there was a revolving door of some kind. Uh, whether what is the case as we as we stand right, specifically so, on operations? All right. So response to that follow up and then honourable list. Um, we, we are seeing greater stability. Uh, there was a period of turbulence, particularly with regard to the appointment of power station general managers. That's now by and large settled. Uh, however, the, the current uh, crop of power station GMs uh, have a relatively short dwell time in those positions. Uh, so I think the average last time we checked was about uh, 18 to 24 months, which is quite short for such a senior position. And we therefore um, need to give those teams the chance to uh, settle down and uh, embed good practices. We have um, launched a number of initiatives to support them. We are introducing additional skills to uh, ensure that there's proper knowledge transfer. We are um, engaging in training programs to equip them with the necessary skill. Uh, we are also uh, launching or have launched uh, an operations excellence program to to drive certain basic operational disciplines to ensure that we have uh, greater stability but also greater managerial discipline at our power stations. I trust that's answered the question, Chair. Thank you very much, Honourable Liz. I think Thank any matter that gets left out at the end of all the members if it's particularly urgent, we'll come back to it. Otherwise, other of them will come in writing. Right, Honorable Liz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, yeah, and I, I think that it, it cannot be denied that um, progress has been made and is being made with regard to corruption and fraud and, and um, fixing issues at ESCOM, I think. The, anyone who denies that is is probably not seeing the full picture. But and the, at the end of the day, the question of keeping the lights on is the key question, and and the lights are not being kept on um, for various reasons that we've heard a lot of this morning. But let me just then focus a little bit on the flu gas um, issue at at Kusile. Is Kosile plant able to generate at a higher percentage than it is because it is being throttled back or shut down or units are being shut down because the gas emissions are exceeding certain levels? And have those levels got more drastic in the recent months? 
So the question is, we're in power, in load shedding. Is part of that load shedding a result of simply cutting back on the generation of electricity at Kusile because certain emissions are above acceptable levels, but across the road at Kendall, those same levels are far exceeded. At Madupi, those same levels are far exceeded. At every other power station in South Africa, coal-powered fire station, those levels are just exceeded. But at Kosile, we cut back on our availability to meet these. Is that the case? And, and, um, and why um, is, are we allowing that to, to hurt the economy of South Africa, essentially? Why is this being allowed to do damage to the lives of every single South African? If that is the case, I don't know. I'm asking the question. With regard to, Mr. Chairman, I, I, um, I very carefully went and shook uh, General Labia's hand when I arrived because, you know, I, I was careful that I might not get arrested. But um, <laughs> what have you done? What have you done? I, I, I don't Confess. know of anything, but Confess. you know, the, the I might have a parking ticket outstanding. <laughs> but Mr. Chairman, I don't have any questions for General Lubia except a comment that um, I'm thrilled to see that at least the Reserve Bank is able to rein in Marcus Euster, even if the Hawks, after all these years, still haven't charged him with anything. Um, <laughs> but you don't have to respond to General Olivia. Um, then the the question of the the um, contracts that are being investigated. There was in Gula, and I, I think it, this is is yours. Who is the contractor at Lagula, in Gula? I ask because I have a particular interest. And, and I suspect it might be a good friend of ex-president Jacob Zuma's, um, but I probably am wrong. Who is, who is that contractor? Um, and and the, the question of the coal that's flowing to Maputo, to the DRC and all over the place, some of it may well be stolen Eskom coal, but I think the majority of it is coal that simply can't get down the Richards Bay line because it's not being properly maintained, it's not being properly secured. And if it gets to Richards Bay, the terminal's operating at, at below par and the demand is there. And so people are desperate to get the stuff out. And we as a country should be desperate for that foreign exchange, not the stolen coal. I accept that that, that should not be happening but I cannot see that all those trucks going to Maputo to all over the place are, are Eskim stolen coal. They'll be going in there with the rest, I have no doubt, but the real issue is that Transnet is a complete mess and the Ports Authority is a mess and that's costing the country big time. So um, I don't know how you solve the stolen coal issue in, in a scenario where so much other legal coal is flowing down those avenues. Mr. Chairman, so much has been asked this morning. I, I, I think I'm going to, to just stop there, except for, let me just, just, I just want to, Andre, just um, address you on this Babcock issue. I raised this question at, at Kosile some months ago, and I was reassured, and I can't remember who by young, um, that everything was in order with this. And now we've got a, a court action. I think we were actually waiting for judgment. I think the court action's over. Yeah. So it's um, it's not, there is no such thing as a sub judicate rule in South Africa anyway. Um, but the, surely if it was just a document that was outstanding for a company that's done business with Eskom for 100 years, um, one could get that document, particularly as I understand that the other two, because there are only three uh, suitable contractors, and the one perhaps you guys were worried about couldn't meet. Them. You negotiated with the other two and dropped prices and did all sorts of things according to the media. Surely a piece of paper? I don't know. Anyway, 
Uh, you may not want to answer, but I, I'm finding it very difficult. And perhaps, Mr. Chairman, what we should do is get a separate report on this Babcock issue from Eskin. Thank you. Okay, that's perfectly um, in order. Um, in any case, the, there's the quarterly reports that Eskin is bringing. So um, I'm sure we'll find a way. Right, see all responses to that and General Libya. We'll start with Eskom. Thank you, Honorable Chair. Thank you, Honorable Lise. Um, the um, FGD, um, the, the, the short answer is no, that we are not throttling, throttling back Kusile because of emissions restrictions. Kusile is not delivering the megawatts that it should because the FGD units are not performing as they should. So what, what we've essentially done and, and, and maybe think of it as, as an exhaust system on a car. If your catalyst in your exhaust system gets clogged and you cannot get rid of your emissions, the engine stops. And that's, that's why when we talk about FGD as a single point of failure, essentially what happens is that exhaust system stops working and then the unit cannot perform as it should. So that's the, that's the reason. It's not as though we... We, we are able to bypass the FGD. Uh, the, 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 there is no bypass valve. So even if we wanted to throw caution to the wind, violate environmental restrictions, we could not do so because we can't divert uh, the flue gas past this desulfurization unit. It's a rather big pipe, <laughs> honorable Lise. Um, so yes, I think that's 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 where we are. Um, I I cannot comment on uh, legal and illegal coal being mixed. Uh, that's 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 not. We just look at inside the fence at at, at ESCOM. I think I've covered all of your questions. The other questions were for the general. No, but uh, I, I, I no, but I was of the view that if. He has a, a response or the really is a comment because to leave it hanging, I think it's only fair we give him a chance if he wants to. Let's hear from him rather. General, if you've got a comment or a reaction, uh, I was told, I was in my other life, I'm a spokesperson and I was told that no comment is also a comment. General? Thank, thank you very much, uh, Honorable Chairperson. Uh, I thought that the Honorable uh, Member has uh, withdrawn, but... Uh... <laughs> General, um, uh, to be fair, I, I thought it's fair to put it to you rather than for us to assume so that there's no ambiguity. We, we have taken note of uh, what uh, the Reserve Bank shall have done with regard to that uh, civil part of uh, the process. The, uh, Prosecutors and the investigators are also working to a certain extent with the affidavit that has been used in the uh, civil uh, case. So that is uh, the, the approach that they have uh, adopted. But uh, I think even this morning, I've been in touch with the uh, National Prosecuting Authority to check what is the current position so that uh, we can move on this. And I think I have indicated in the past that uh, Certain processes, uh, we were of the view that we can already move, but uh, we are not prosecuting. We present, as said, uh, the evidence uh, comes to our attention. So I think that I should say at this stage, that is where we are standing. So there is that uh, interaction. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you very much, uh, General. I think, in fact, that is helpful. Um, so I think it's great that it was raised, albeit in jest. Honorable Hatteben and Honorable Mente. No, no, thanks, Che. Um, let me start where Honorable Liz um, left off, including Honorable Somia. Che, on this um, flu gas desulfurization system, it's the first of its kind in South Africa and in the continent. And it's used to reduce or remove sulfur dioxide from the burning of coal. Now, what I find it unacceptable or uncomfortable 
is that it has is going to cost 35 to 40 billion to install in Midupi. Clearly, it has costed more or less the same in Kusile. To date, in fact, when we went there for our oversight, we were told clear that you are relying on the original equipment manufacturer to, to fix any breakages or breakdown in relation to that system. Yet in your response, you are saying to us, when we had raised the issue of skills transfer, your response is that most original equipment manufacturers contract have skills transfer obligation in it. Some of these units in Kusile have been commissioned since 2017, 2021, and then to date, you have not transferred any skill. When that system breaks, the entire unit shut down. You have to rely on the original equipment manufacturer from overseas to come and fix the system. Again, what, what is also making me uncomfortable, I'm, I'm not too sure who was responding. You said there is a contract now in place for operating and maintaining uh, the system. You, you spend close to 40 billion to install a system. Uh, you go again, get the same original equipment manufacturer to come and operate and maintain your system. How much is that contract costing? That I find it unacceptable, Chair. You can't uh, uh, give the same person uh, 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 benefit of installing the system and that system fails the very same person, you give him another contract to come and, and maintain. Clearly, uh, there's a monopoly of some sort there. I can't accept that. But you need to look into this matter. It's almost seven years this system has been installed. To date, there's no one at ESCOM, none whatsoever, who's got experience to maintain the system. The current challenges in Kusile of load shading that we're experiencing, the major contributing factor is this flue gas desulfurization system that is consistently uh, breaking down. And the entire unit has to be shut down for it to be maintained. It can continue like this. They are in a process of rolling out to Midupi. Because of lack of experience, the same challenges is going to happen. Would have wasted 80 billion. In fact, would have empowered overseas companies with 80 billion and call them again to come and operate the system that we should be operating ourselves. That is completely unacceptable. We have raised this issue. Our, uh, initially, before you responded, I wanted to ask how many since we were there, how many officials have you trained? Because we've raised this issue and it's not for the first time raising it six months down the line. Have you trained any officials to ensure that they are capable to maintain the system? Um, that chair does not augur well with me. The, the, the next question, Chair, um, which it was our recommendation again in 2019, the issue of ex, um, this extension and expansion of contracts. Yes. Uh, in, in your response, okay, when we raise this to say you need to manage the extension and expansion of contract, what we meant was that reduce relying on deviation and expansion of contract. Because in terms of the constitution and PFMA of ensuring competitive, equitable, and fair procurement system, when you extend the contract, you cannot achieve a competitiveness, you cannot achieve uh, uh, equity. Your, your response does not give us an indication whether or not you have managed to reduce uh, relying on deviation to extend the contracts. What then we want to know, we, so let us, let us spell it out. Since 2019, we need a list of how many contracts 
are currently active. No, in fact, how many contracts were currently active then through deviation and expansion? And to date, has the number reduced? If it has, how many contracts are currently active? That will give us a sense whether or not you are managing. Not this response that is given here. You are saying you are managing this. Let's compare April with April. We need to know what was there in 2019, what is currently there now. And that will give us a sense of whether or not you are managing. Um, again, Chair, the correction of defects identified at Midupi and Kusile power station. The response is ESCOM is making steady progress in developing and implementing effective technical solution. Effective technical solution. And then when you read at the bottom, it says the completion of this correction of defects will take up to 2027. But what is making me uncomfortable is depending on the extent of this technical solution. You are terming it as an effective technical solution. Yet when you're supposed to give us an assurity of when are you going to fix the defects, we are saying depending on the technical solution. I, I think we need to be told what is this technical solution? What is this effective? Because I mean, I can easily come here and say we're implementing a solution to fix. And that does not give me comfort or any understanding whether or not you're on top of your game. 2027 to fix the defects. Remember these two major projects, Midupi and Kusile, were implemented to address the issue of energy capacity in the country. It can continue up until 20, 2017 to fix the defect. No, Chair, I, I refused to accept. The fourth question, Chair, where is the mine in Kusile? Group Chief Executive, because you are the last man standing. The other board, uh, the bid farewell. We raised this issue. Let me, uh, the board, the determination of the location of Midupi and Kusile was based on the fact that there is coal and mine in and around the area. Therefore, you're not going to rely on trucks transporting coal. When we went there, there was no mine in Kusile. Hence, 700 trucks transporting coal a day. Hence, this issue of mixing coal. And there was a conveyor belt that was meant to be um, built from that mine to Kusile. We, we ask that question. I don't see any response here. Where is the mine? What's happening with the mine? You chose the location based on the fact that there is cold on the ground. So we cannot continuously put measures in place to make sure that these thugs and criminals don't mix cold, don't collude. Yet we were told that that won't be a case that would confront ESCOM precisely because there's a cold nearby. All you need is to activate whatever that needs to be done for the mine to be active. And then the conveyor belt will take the coal raw as it is, quality as it is straight to, to the plant. But we're not told the whereabouts of the mine. Maybe it's missing. We need GPS and navigation system to allocate the exact coal. We need to be told, change underground. No, but there is no coal, there is no coal. People are still uh, 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 extract, are relying on, are still relying on tracks. <laughs> Lastly, Chair, I'm glad that we invited the board to be here and we welcome you. I'm not going to ask any question in relation to the board. They are new, but get, there's, nature allows no vacuum in, in the country. And there's law of, um, what, what, what's this law of um, English Balegi? <laughs> English Balegi, but be that as it may, 
our understanding is that you were appointed based on your skills and that you are competent, qualified to do the work. You have seen and witnessed the extent of road damage that the ESCOM officials are helping themselves in terms of corruption. What we want and require from you is the assurity that you have accepted this, this responsibility fully knowing what you are getting yourself into. Secondly, you're not going to turn around and lead ESCOM with the mirror in front of you and only telling us about what happened in the past. We want solution for the future. We don't want to be at loggerheads with you shifting the goalposts and blame gaming and naming of who is responsible for the challenges that are currently confronting ESCOM. And if you can give chair through you of the board, if you can give us that assurity so that next time when we want accountability, we are going to be justified based on the PFMA and in relation of your judicial responsibilities as enshrined in the uh, PFMA. Mm -hmm. It is your responsibility to make sure that you prevent fruitless and wasteful expenditure from continuously being the case at ESCOM. It is your responsibility to ensure that those who are responsible for causing fruitless and wasteful expenditure are held accountable. It doesn't matter who you are and what position you hold, even if it means that the group CEO is party to that, you are going to leave no stone unturned in ensuring, I'm not saying it's that Andre, I'm just making an example, so that we are clear in terms of what is expected of you. Thank you so much, Chair. Thank you very much. I think the context is important, Honorable Hatteb, in so far as the issue of the mine, because when we were there at Kusile in 2019, the commitment given was that the issues around the mine would be sorted out by January 2020. When we returned, uh, when we returned when, in April, uh, there was no mine. We had a long discussion about it. And we keep going back to this mine issue precisely because, as Honorable Hafan Minen has previously stressed, is to push back on the frontiers of the prevalence of the trucks, 700 of them, on a daily basis, as Honorable Atebe said, coming into uh, Gusile, the damage to infrastructure, road infrastructure that those trucks are doing amongst others, and the risks involved with the quality of coal as well. So I think that's why that issue will continuously come up. And that's why I, I found it almost hilarious uh, when we raised the issue in, in April uh, of the truck, of the mine. And one Geno said, it has emerged that actually Gosile was built, is built on a coal mine. I'm like, how do you mean it has emerged? That, that was the entire concept from inception. Right with the mind. So I, I just raise it because I think we need a particular clarity on that. Um, that's why I'm, 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 I'm not really trying to come into the members' questions, but I'm, I'm, I'm zooming into it because it, it's material to why that power station is there. And you have not met the deadlines that you gave us, not ours, yours. So I think that the that's the importance of that. Yeah, well, that's the question we asked in April. I'm trading very carefully today. All right, CEO, over to you. Thank you, uh, Honorable Chair and Honorable Khadebe. Um, so the uh, FGD at uh, Madupi has not yet been awarded to any contractor. So we, we uh, at this stage, cannot say if it's the same contract or not because it's, it's going out on tender. Um, in order to address some of the issues that we have confronted with the operation and maintenance of the FGD at uh, Kusile, we are scoping into the contract the provision of these services for Madupi so that we can understand that this particular risk will be managed and mitigated uh, up front. Um, 
in order to give the committee uh, a little bit more color on the skills challenges in operating the FGD, if I can ask Rilani Matabula, who's the group executive responsible for generation, to just give a short overview, please, Rilani, on the challenges that we have with operating the FGD at Kusile. The challenges and the solutions. Yeah. <clears throat> Okay. Yeah. So when when the FGD was built um, by General Electric, what, what they did is they had um, multiple international service providers that uh, they contracted with to supply them with different sections and components of that system. And when when it was built, and actually they had contractual agreements that only allows those service providers to service us via uh, General Electric. And that is why we so it prudent that uh, we recontract General Electric to help us uh, manage this plant while we we get uh, our teams um, up to speed. So that is what we we have done. Um, so yes, we had uh, our own um, subsidiary, uh, Rotec Industries, to to look after this plant, but. Uh, we realized with the challenges that we have that uh, they, their skill level is not at the level where we can be able to sustainably uh, manage the challenges that we are experiencing with this plant. And then we, we needed the support of the original equipment manufacturer. So I didn't hear the... I, I, I was not, oh, okay. Follow-ups come when they are done. Uh, bam, but noted. Right. Uhip Njalu Long Shupai. Right, CEO. Thank you, Honorable Chair. I'm going to ask our Chief Procurement Officer, Jantri Sanko, to respond on deviations and expansions, please. Thank you, Chair. So I can confirm that perhaps the, the wording might not have been con you know in sufficient detail, but certainly we've put a lot of effort in understanding why we have expansions and deviations. So some of the areas that we found is obviously the inefficiency or the bureaucracy of the procurement process. And I can confirm in terms of that, we've made some step changes into reducing the number of committees and governance. We have shortened the times to do um, certain types of assessments. We've cut out on, on activities that were not critical. We've also put um, enabling uh, um, policies and procedures on the front end so that you can actually do procurement planning up to contracting strategy, even before you secure your funding. So we've shortened the time that it takes for something to go to market, because that was one of the main reasons that you'd have this overlap of needing, needing a contract because your procurement processes are taking months or years. So that's the first thing I can confirm. We've reduced the cycle times, we've reduced the bureaucracy that causes deviations and expansions to, to occur. I can also confirm that we, in terms of policy and procedure, see Section 217 of the Constitution to be protected. So I can tell you as CPO, deviations and expansions are really not the order of the day. And we actually make sure that every single one of them are actually correctly motivated in terms of what they need to do. We're further saying in terms of the new instruction note, and I should clarify that there is now reporting on all types of, you know, not just the thresholds of 15 million and 15%. We actually re respond on urgent procurement, single source, sole source, emergency procurement to National Treasury within 14 days. So there's a lot more monitoring of this process to give you comfort. And of course, then we challenge and we have these conversations with CPO and, 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 and the monitoring office in terms of understanding why these deviations took place and actually getting comfort early in the process while we're still contracting. We're also enhancing our processes in terms of procurement planning, because obviously planning for procurement and I think uh, monitoring tender contracts that are about to be canceled. So we're looking actively to say, this contract is, is gonna be canceled in 12 months time. Do you have an arrangement in place? We also then match up the tender cancellations and, and, and advertised items that are on the procurement plan that did not take place on time to see if they contributed. So part of our reporting that we do to National Treasury is to see if any of the tenders canceled are impacting on a deviation or expansion. And that, that, that checks and balances are also in there to see that we're not using 
delays or inefficiencies to do to deal with deviations and expansions. So I think I want to give you comfort. I think the numbers are not going up. It is not included in the presentation itself, but we can make that available because we do quarterly reporting on expansions and deviations. Thank you. Honourable Chair, um, sorry. no, proceed. Um, Honourable Chair, through you, just to confirm what the CPO said, we, we will provide that uh, list in future reports to this committee. And uh, through the Secretariat, we can also make that available for the past quarter. So we can be transparent on that. Um, if I can ask the um, COO to please take us through the defects and the uh, correction of the defects. Thank you, Andre. Honorable Chair, Honorable Member. Um, as I said, we had, we've identified the five major uh, modifications that we had to implement. So we've done it on all the units at Medupi. Let's put unit number four, but it was implemented on, on four as well. And we've implemented on the four units at Kusili already. Now, we have implemented it already on unit four, but unfortunately we had now the setback on unit four. So while we're busy now with the construction on unit number six, that will be implemented. I'm talking about the five major ones on um, unit six as well. And this is why if you look at the commercial operation date for unit six, it is the middle of uh, 2024. So the five major modifications we would have, or by, by the middle of 2024, Actually, end of 23, it would have been implemented now on all the units. What we are meaning on 2027 is the additional modifications that we would like to implement. The one being the flow through the fabric filter plant, you know, the flow through the uh, gas air heaters. Those we will do and implement as outages become available on these 12 units. So that is important to understand. So I understand where you're coming from. Why do we have to wait for 2027? But unfortunately, you have to have that unit that is offline that you can implement those modifications. So it's not that we're procrastinating or delaying whatsoever. It will be dependent on unit outages. But we want to achieve the same 85% at Kusile after we've solved this issue with the, the FGD. Thank you, Jan. Um, lastly, uh, your, your question, where is the mine at Kusili? We actually, in our presentation, showed an aerial photograph of the mine. So it does exist. It's not, it's not a rumor. Um, but maybe what we can do through you, Chair, is to arrange a visit, uh, if, if, if that is required, to inspect the mine, to see that it's there. Uh, it is being developed. The conveyor belt is being built. So we, we, we are in full alignment with your sentiments that we should get trucks off the road, go onto conveyor, as the original intention was when, when Kusile was conceived. And for a number of reasons, there has been procrastination on this, but we now are forging ahead with uh, unlocking the new lager reserve. Thank you, Chair. Um, I think the final issue was to the board that you place them on accepting this mammoth responsibility. I think we'll find a date for that visit, colleagues. It should be a one day. I will look for one and make uh, and make an application yeah, to go to the mine. Um, probably if, yeah, yeah, all right. All right, so, all right, Mr. Chairman, over to you, sir. Honorable Chair, thank you very much, honorable members. The, the principle I've been following so far in terms of us as a board coming in is to guard against uh, chest pounding tendencies. Um, we would rather be judged by the results that we will produce. What we've committed to uh, together as a board, as uh, I indicated, since the 30th of September, we've already had three working sessions as a board. So firstly, that should show that we're not a, a passive board. We take the responsibilities with which we've been entrusted uh, with the seriousness that we believe it deserves. I indicated in my opening remarks that we already have created uh, board committees. So in the next week, they will be meeting 
ahead of the scheduled end of October uh, meeting of the board. On the 1st of November, we have a comprehensive review of the strategy with our executive colleagues. Um, and, and that we see also as a task that will be ongoing. But what we've committed to amongst ourselves is that we will become what is referred to as an engaged board, which simply means that uh, without stepping on, overstepping our role and stepping on the toes of the executive team, we intend to be actively engaged in uh, supporting the executive team in resolving whatever challenges that exist. What is painfully clear to all of us as a board is that the challenges are not just purely financial or systemic in terms of uh, the impact that the previous climate we've had of state capture has done in terms of collapsing internal controls. But ESCOM is a complex system. You, you've got to deal with it holistically. The nub of it though, the nub of it though is that if we're to turn around and yield positive energy availability, we felt we needed a committee that goes into the, the belly of the organization. And that's why we've created this uh, business operations technical committee. So as I understand that we will be reverting back on a quarterly basis, I think the next quarterly report should show whether we we mean what we say when we say we're an active board or not. If if I may say, uh, Chair, with, with that, uh, I think that's the best we can say now. Uh, whether our skill sets are appropriate or not will be determined by the results that we produce. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, Chair. We will have to be your final follow-ups and then Honorable Mente to come in. Not new question. No, it's not a new question, Chair. Um, I didn't get the clarity when you're saying you have contracted, um, you've mentioned a company uh, to manage the F, uh, F no, the gentleman behind you, um, um, the one that was responding to um, the Flickers decentralization. Which company is that you've contracted to manage the system? Chair, um, if I may, the, we, we, we have a wholly owned subsidiary called ERI Rotec, uh, which is the engineering subsidiary of ESCOM, and they have assisted us with the operation of the FGD. Rolani, can you confirm? Chair, through you, yes. Um, ESCOM Rotec Industry is the current operator and maintainer of our blue gas diaphragm plant. <clears throat> so what we the, the arrangement that we are making as management now is for them to have the, the support they require from the original equipment manufacturer. And obviously this is a new, not a new thing in ESCOM. We have the same arrangements for our turbines and, and other plants uh, where original equipment manufacturers are contracted to provide technical support. So, so Chair, what I'm trying to get is, so there's a possibility that in this new tender, the very same original equipment manufacturing, which has amassed close to 40 billion, can be contracted to maintain the very same system that is failing currently. Okay, that's the last bite, the response to that. Uh, Chair, I think it's important to emphasize that it's, it is it is not uh, feasible or appropriate to apportion all of the blame for the challenges that we have to the original equipment manufacturer. I think from an ESCOM perspective, our own lack of operational knowledge plays a significant role in why the unit is not performing. As you remarked during your initial questions, this is known technology. It is new to South Africa, but it's it is, it is not unknown internationally. 
and therefore i think the approach of bringing in the requisite skill um, should address the issue um, to disqualify the the supplier based on the performance at kusile i think could be construed as prejudicial and could expose us to 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 all sorts of challenges so at this point in time, um, I think when we go out to tender, we want to cast the net wide, uh, see what's out there in the world, and we will no doubt um, consider offers and bids from any qualified supplier of this equipment based on a competitive and transparent bidding process. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Honorable Mente. <laughs> Thank you very much, Chair, and good afternoon to everyone. Uh, Chair, I want to plead with you that um, as much as there were questions posed before, um, I'm yet going to ask more or less similar questions, but I will then expand why. That's perfectly fine. Yes. Um, Honorable Som, you asked a question in terms of the sustainability and the provision thereof of energy to the citizens of the country. In layman's terms, he asked if, are we safe? Can we say we can have electricity? That's what he asked. And in addition to that, he is asking, are you in a position to provide that? And if yes, how much will it cost? If no, what must be done? The reason why I'm revisiting that question, Chair, there's many narratives that are being driven out there where ESCOM is concerned. And we need to find comfort, Chairperson of the Board, because one, the mandate of ESCOM is very clear, and that's where we should stick. So, ESCOM has to provide energy which is affordable to the country's citizens. As things stand, if you're an ordinary citizen in South Africa earning between a basic income, which is 3,500 and 10,000 rand, you can barely afford electricity. But at the very same time, the rates of electricity in South Africa are skyrocketing. And therefore, it means that the mandate of ESCOM, we are no longer serving it. We are serving a mandate that says you will only afford our service as a state entity only if you earn above 15,000 rand. It excludes the people that we're talking to. So if we drive a narrative of also seeking to get extra. Um, business people to assist ESCOM in providing energy to South Africans, it means that price is going to go much higher. And therefore, it will not be any way or form serving the people of South Africa. Then we are serving someone else. That was the question or, or, or Honorable Somio was asking. Now, um, the second question I have is to um, the executive which was presenting on disciplinary actions consequent management. And I want to believe that this consequent management is as a result of only the SIU cases 
or anything related to the contracts and anything that has to do with the failures of ESCOM in terms of um, either work at, at uh, monitoring work at technical or any level. Now you have given us more than 300 cases, but what I see is 131 cases that have been sent to SAPS. I do not know what's the explanation of that. Can we get an explanation as to 131 cases to SAPS versus 300 cases, that 300 plus cases, but you did give a figure of those that um, have left the service as well. But the people who have left the service doesn't mean they did not commit crime. So that excuse also cannot be used as there's the we could didn't open cases against those people. Whether you have gone to retirement, you resigned or whatsoever, if you still breathe, it means you must go and answer to your crimes. So I'd like to understand why do we have only 131 criminal cases from ESCOM versus the more than 300 that was reported by yourself. And then we come to the recoupment of funds from different service providers. Again, I'm going to go back to the board. The reason why we are here and we're dealing with all these sorts of corruptions, of cases, of overpayment, of everything, is because ESCOM can barely survive on its own. And I don't see any appetite of developing ESCOM into being a business that can sustain itself without relying outside. We rely to the outside world for everything in ESCOM. We don't have businesses and components within ESCOM that provide us with what we need in order for ESCOM to survive. So we have contracts for everything that provide ESCOM with all the resources they require in order for them to perform. And that's what the board has to look into. Isn't there a way of insourcing these businesses and getting ESCOM to be in a space and a platform where it can perform without relying so much to the outside world. A an example is the mine that uh, both the chair and Honorable Hadeb spoke of earlier on. And the very same mandate, which is developmental by its nature, Econ Oil on your report says um, at the end it says it's pending, but in the same vein you mentioned that it's blacklisted. And I want you to explain to us if Econ Oil is blacklisted, but you also say at the end of the slide of um, Econ Oil uh, is uh, court cases and things are pending. But most interestingly, if Econ Oil is blacklisted, why is ABB still operational? Because ABB and Econ Oil both have the same breaches in terms of the legislation and in terms of the regulations of ESCOM where contracts are concerned. Again, on ABB, you say you will then institute disciplinary actions against ABB in due course. So what informs your quick decision on Econ Oil? And what informs you taking so many years to deal with ABB? 
The last part, which also SIU reported on, is that ABB, you have an agreement with ABB in terms of their repayments. And now ABB is at the stage where it's um, being negotiated to come and finish off the work it has started. And I'm sitting here and I'm asking myself, Chairperson, why are we begging ABB to finish off the work it was supposed to have finished off a long time ago? Why is it not paying back all the money that is supposed to be paid and then we get a service provider that's fit and proper? Why must we beg ABB instead of blacklisting ABB like we did with Econ Oil? So there is two imbalances here. And these two imbalances, we don't want to find problems in them. But sitting here, I'm finding a problem already. We have Econ Oil, which is majority black owned. We have ABB, which is majority white owned and international. Econ Oil, the decision was taken, was finally done. It must go defend itself at court. ABB were begging it. The very same ESCOM, the very st same state entity. And the worst part of it, the reason you provided to us in um, towards the end of the year last year of Econ Oil, there was a meeting we had with ESCOM in respect to Econ Oil, was that there was a judgment on the issue of Econ Oil, which vindicated ESCOM. I think all of us by now, we know the developments of the judgment. We know of the revelations that the judgment was based of, on the non-existing uh, document. And that document, that revelation was made by the very same judge who gave the judgment. Where does that put ESCOM today? after that revelation, who is footing the bill of all those court processes where all Econ Oil is gonna go back to court and say, I was unfairly removed and I was unfairly dealt with, now to the point of being blacklisted, who's going to bear the cost? Meantime, we're begging ABP, you are not doing anything. Uh, and then the, the, the next question is on Midupi, the unit four explosion, once more. The unit four explosion, when we were there, it was reported to us as the most recent uh, case that took place. The question was asked, where was the monitoring mechanism? Because for that unit to get to a stage of exploding, it means that there were indicators. Unless then is part of all those defects that you can't even see yourself that a unit is going to explode. And there wasn't a clear answer as to what mechanisms are in place except for an answer that was saying filter bags that were put in had to be removed and then uh, there's too many filter bags that must be fitted at a very huge sum of money and there was an exercise of removing half of it and then adding that. We still want to know the mechanism to monitor Midupi so that we do not get the same situation of the explosion. And who is supposed to monitor that? We asked that previously, that who was supposed to monitor it, but we were directed to the most junior staff members and we rejected that. We rejected that we were told about people who are supposed to work night shift. Where is the senior person who was supposed to see that operations in ESCOMs are always monitored and are always on par? We can't be directed to a person who is supposed to come in for night shift and that person is the most lower level person and that one now must be charged. 
There should be a system at ESCOM in some offices that has indicators of reds and greens and yellows happening. That person who's monitoring, who's that person? We're never given that name. That name and the mechanism of monitoring that Midupi is never going to undergo the very same explosion again. And Kusile, Honorable Adebe has already asked the question of the, the skill and the issue of the FGD. My addition to that is there was a mention of uh, in the minister's plea that she's going to make environmental minister in order for us not to be forced to do this FGD. And that uh, response was not given. Now, if there is anything going with the Minister of Environmental Affairs in order for us to find some kind of an exception to this FGD, because in true sense, we are minimally contributing to the emissions, very minimal to non-existent in true sense. So let's not be attributed to things that are costly. At the very same time, we can manage them ourselves in some other way by using certain tools and not tools that are imposed on us. Because the FGD right now, I still didn't get comfort CEO with the explanation of, we don't have a technical know-how of that smidgey. We does have it. When it breaks, we depend on, under, on other people to fix it. It costs us money. We are not manufacturing any piece of its equipment. We are not employing people. Economically, we are not contributing to South African economy with that same system. So what is it in need for us as South Africans? It goes back to the mandate of ESCOM and us serving the South African citizens. Then the vetting. There's still an out outstanding vetting, especially on the executives. Would like to understand why is that the case? And if we have to intervene, Chair, especially in the case of SSA, we have to, because this was back in 2019. We still haven't received the results of the vetting. Meantime, we've already dealt with the most lowest ranks and even referred their cases to criminal activities and others in SIU, others have been disciplined. But within the executive, we have got a high number of executives vetting processes that is outstanding. So we may be sitting with either clear people or we may be sitting with people that we must deal with. And let's please get that answer so that we can intervene. Intimidation. Okay, and the, the contract management. In your slide, last sentence of your slide on contract management, you say you are establishing a contract management office across the divisions. By when is this going to be done? By whom? So that we can follow it up. Because in two months time, we're going to find people breaching the rules and regulations of contract. And we will not be asking, getting someone to ask a question. How did you not detect that? And the last one, there was an insinuation of that uh, ESCOM has got 66% bloated staff. I would like to get an indication of the CEO if is that the case? And if it's that the case, why does it take it? more than a day to service people, in particular in rural areas. If you call ESCOM for any technical fault, 
they do not come within four hours. And the reason is always given that we have less staff members and less fleet, especially to drive in those gravel roads. And the other painful thing in the rural areas is that you only service people between Monday and Friday, Saturday and Sunday, anything that happens. If it affects one household, ESCOM doesn't come out. ESCOM will come on Monday. It begs a question, how do we determine that? Because every household is important. We don't service businesses, people who will jump if ever. It's a big business that its meat is going to rot. But we do not jump when a household of a person whose meat is rotting in the fridge. That's a South African, that's a voter. That's a person who is paying for their electricity. But because you are one household, we can't come. How do we determine the importance and the prioritization of servicing the South Africans by ESCO? Thank you, Jay. Um, thank you very much, Honorable Mente. All right, can we get um, responses to those? And then Honorable Pukas will close it off for us. Thank you, Honorable Chair. Thank you, Honorable Mente. Um, with regard to your question on uh, ESCOM and ESCOM's provision of electricity, I think it's important to emphasize that ESCOM cannot, without government approval, procure new electricity, nor can it build new uh, power stations. Uh, case in point, we recently submitted two projects to uh, the Department of Mineral Resources and Energy for Section 34 concurrence. Uh, these two projects were denied permission. Uh, to proceed in spite of the fact that they are shovel ready and, and good to go. Um, so much as we would like to be actively involved in the provision of new generation capacity, we, we are precluded from doing so. Um, similarly, we, we have had challenges with uh, short-term power procurement from uh, entities that have excess electricity available that they could feed into the grid. Uh, we, we were, um, through various uh, regulatory decisions, prevented from, from accessing that. Hopefully now with the, uh, the NECOM uh, operating, we can, we can overcome that. In terms of the cost of electricity, um, I think the, the cost of electricity in South Africa is a, is a, is a complex and sensitive topic, clearly. Um, first of all, as far as indigent uh, customers are concerned, they are able to apply to the municipality for um, free basic electricity. Uh, and, and that gives them the opportunity to access uh, electricity uh, without having to pay for it. Now, what we have noticed is that the take up of this free basic electricity is, is much lower than we would have anticipated. So I think there, there is a need for municipalities in particular to communicate to their residents that there is this option that residents can access free basic electricity um, on uh, without any charge. Um, and I think that, that that would be a a positive step in the right direction. Um, Having said that, part of the reason why ESCOM's financial woes are where they are is that for a number of years in the past, we had adverse tariff decisions. And that led to a cumulative uh, revenue shortfall totaling some 380 billion rand, which coincides very closely to the debt burden that ESCOM faces today. And the reason for it is that we had to go out and borrow money to pay for our operating expenses, which is not a sustainable practice. So between um, a tariff which is affordable, which does not hamper economic impact, but which is also cost reflective, a balance needs to be found that makes sense for South Africa. And that is the job of NOSA to uh, come up with a tariff structure that enables that, and, and, and that is their mandate. And we are involved in, in discussions with NOSA on that topic. Uh, if I could ask uh, Chris to please respond to the issue of consequence management, including uh, the cases reported to SAPS and where we have actually seen uh, prosecutions. Chris, please. Thanks, Andre. Honorable Chair, 
when we talk consequence management, um, we refer to, and, and I just want to give context, um, we, ref, we refer to, to four actions. Um, one will be a disciplinary action, um, one will be criminal action, one civil action, and the last one being uh, the review of the internal controls. And the criteria for counting criminal um, action is that one investigation will have one criminal case, as opposed to the criteria for counting disciplinary action, in that um, you could have, for example, in one criminal case, if we take the example of the Chubula matter, where we've got 10 accused, uh, in a single case, as opposed to a disciplinary action where it's counted by a number of uh, employees. So we could have, um, so there, there would never be a correlation between the number of criminal cases and the number of disciplinary actions um, that were uh, handled by the organization. So in this presentation, we've had 389 um, recommendations for disciplinary action. That is the count of employees. Um, while we had 131 criminal cases, so in one criminal case, you could have 10 accused. And that is the reason why um, there would never be um, a correlation um, in, in that instance. Lastly, um, Chair, there are also instances where we would report a criminal case during the course of a forensic investigation before we complete. And that is because we require the assistance of the um, SAPS given the constraints that internal investigators um, has. So, and that is the other reason why there will never be, be a correlation at any given moment of the two numbers. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, um, Honorable Chair. So if I can deal with the Econ Oil matter, um, I think there, there, there may be, um, a conflation between the issue of deregistering and blacklisting. So deregistering um, is what happens when we stop doing business with a company whom we uh, have good reason to believe has acted in uh, a manner that uh, violates uh, the expected conduct standards that we expect from our suppliers. We then uh, deregister the supplier from our database. Uh, the supplier is given ample opportunity to make submissions to be heard uh, at the supplier review committee to make representations. Um, and Econ Oil has, has uh, made use of that opportunity. Once we have followed that step uh, and a decision has been taken to deregister, we are then required to inform National Treasury that. Uh, we have taken this step and National Treasury um, then conducts its own investigation, um, whether or not it wishes to extend this uh, restriction on the supply across all state entities. But that is not our decision. We are merely required to inform National Treasury um, of our decision. With regard to the um, matter um, on which uh, the the judge in the econ uh, oil matter ruled, Judge Valley, um, he has, I think, acknowledged uh, um, on a number of occasions that there have been um, uh, that 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 he possibly erred, and I don't want to put words in his mouth, but he erred in in relying on a confirmatory affidavit. Um, however, this point was raised in uh, petitions made to the um, High Court, uh, a full bench of the High Court, as well as the Supreme Court of Appeal. Uh, both these courts uh, did not uh, regard the issue raised with uh, respect to uh, Judge Valley's reliance on this confirmatory affidavit as material and therefore did not grant leave to appeal. Um, it, it is not within our ambit to, to second guess the High Court or the Supreme Court of Appeal. That, that is up to those two institutions to, um, to uh, make their verdicts and their findings based on the law as those 
judges see it, um, and, and, and we obviously respect the courts in that regard. Um, ABB, um, I think, is, is a slightly different matter, and let me try and explain why. Uh, first of all, ABB self-reported. So when uh, ABB became aware that there was uh, unethical conduct, they then self-reported and they settled. So they paid the uh, amount of damages that ESCOM suffered. Secondly, uh, in a submission that we made to National Treasury, we pointed out to National Treasury that the work that uh, ABB is doing on control and instrumentation at Kusile is now 90% complete. If we were to um, eject ABB from the Kusile project, what would happen is that we would delay the completion of Kusile by between four to five years because we would have to have a different contractor come in to replace all of the equipment. Uh, we have estimated that this would result in additional load shedding uh, that would have an impact on the economy of about 162 billion rand, as well as um, a billion rand claim against ESCOM from various contractors who would be delayed in the execution of their work. The... Um, situation that we therefore have with ABB is that, uh, as Advocate Matibi has indicated, we are approaching the court to have the contract set aside as fundamentally unlawful, first of all, because it was based on corruption, and that a new contract to complete the work be uh, put in place, and that uh, ABB will not make any profit on that work. So it will be uh, done on a cost basis. So on the entire contract, uh, the, the intention is that ABB will not um, be rewarded for any unethical conduct that it may have been um, engaged in during the installation of the control and instrumentation at Kusile. So we do think that uh, given the constraints that we have with the completion of the contract, the advanced stage of uh, the work performed by ABB as well as the risks posed to uh, both ESCOM and the economy at large, that this is uh, the best outcome that we could have um, hoped for, bearing in mind that they did pay us the, the 1.577 um, billion rand um, to, to compensate ESCOM for um, overpayments due to corruption. Um, I would like to ask Rulani Matabula to deal with the Madupi 4 incident, uh, what steps are in place or what mechanisms are in place to monitor and to prevent similar incidents from taking place in the future. Rulani, please. Thanks, Sergio. Yeah, the incident at uh, Madupi Unit 4, it was purely um, a human error that was picked up uh, obviously during an investigation. Um, the activity that was carried out on the day, it's a one of our critical activities that we carry out at our plants. Um, and uh, we require competent and trained personnel to, to carry that out. Uh, the process itself um, requires that because our generators are cooled with hydrogen, it requires that any time when work has to be carried out in that uh, chamber, you have to page it with uh, CO2 and then later page it with air uh, before you can have people working there. And when you have to put the generator back in service, you have to reverse the process, meaning that you have to again put in CO2 and then put in H2. That is to avoid having air coming into contact with hydrogen. So the error that happened is that uh, we had a, a mixture of air and hydrogen during a paging process that resulted in that uh, explosion. So in the process, um, uh, employees who were involved, including their managers, were subjected to a disciplinary process. That has been concluded. Um, and uh, 
two of the middle managers, the operating manager and the shift manager uh, were dismissed. And uh, I know there's also cases that uh, we have currently at CCMA where they are appealing their, their dismissal. Um, as I said, um, currently we have got 12 generators that are off with work being carried out in gen different generators and all have followed the same process of uh, of paging and uh, so it's a, it's a it's a routine activity that we do however the medupi issue uh, was really a, an an error thank you thank you uh, Rulani. um honorable mente i must admit and, and and i say so with a bit of trepidation um that with regard to the installation of FGD at Madupi, uh, I agree with you that there are other options that we could investigate. Um, 30 to 40 billion Rand is indeed a lot of money. And based on our an analysis, we will see no measurable improvement in ambient air quality. There will be an improvement in the emissions at the stack, but not at ambient air level. And the reason for that simply is that the air shed in the Lipalale area is relatively unpolluted. So don't want to sound too cynical, but the air shed can accommodate significantly more SOX emissions uh, than are required to be abated. Having said all of that, we are required to comply with the law. So we don't have an option. We have to make this investment. It is part of the minimum emission standards that are promulgated by the Department of Fishery, Forestry and the Environment. And we therefore have to uh, install this equipment. It is also enshrined in the uh, financing that we obtained for Madupi, particularly from the World Bank. And uh, if we do not install FGD, this would be regarded as a breach of the terms of that loan agreement. So we we therefore um, have to proceed with this particular investment, and that's that's why we are going forward with it. Um, as far as vetting is concerned, um, Honourable Chair, uh, we agree that this has been um, long outstanding. We have seen um, a very long delay in vetting being completed. It is our understanding that the vetting unit at the SSA uh, has a significant backlog. Uh, and we, we also understand that they are now prioritizing uh, ESCOM and that we will see great attraction going forward. With regard to the contract management office, uh, this is uh, put in place at uh, the group capital division, and it will be put in place for the rest of the business um, by uh, March 2023, so by the end of the financial year. We will have a contract management office operational in all of our businesses across ESCOM. Uh, and I think if, if, I, if I may suggest that we add that to uh, the issues that are tracked going forward. Um, if I can just respond to a question that I, that I omitted to address, which is the matter that it is pending uh, with, with Econ Oil. Um, the, issue with, with Econ Oil is that they are the, um, the so-called dominus of the litigation. So they are driving the litigation. Um, they have made an application to have the board decision uh, to cancel the contract, to have that set aside. Um, and in that role as, as the litigant, they have not taken further action. So the fact that it is pending is not due to inaction from the ESCOM side but rather from the uh, other litigant in this matter. Uh, the a question around uh, bloated staff, uh, I, I, I think that this is an unfortunate narrative that uh, is the consequence of a World Bank study that has been rebutted a number of times with proper data. Um, I think the, the World Bank itself has acknowledged that it was based on uh, faulty assumptions. Uh, we we simply cannot manage ESCOM with 
the staff that the World Bank indicated, because I don't think that they um, had an appropriate baseline to compare against. Um, we, we have implemented uh, stringent overtime management as a way to contain costs, uh, particularly in our distribution business. We uh, have been aware uh, for some time that overtime is abused uh, and that work that should have been done during the week uh, was deferred to the weekend uh, in order to enable staff to qualify for overtime. So as part of our uh, attempts to manage our costs, we have implemented measures that um, have unfortunately resulted in a reduction in our service level during weekends when there's only a single household that requires service. And this is applied across the board. This, this is not um, only restricted to rural areas or areas that are remote. Uh, it applies to, to all areas. Where there are multiple households or multiple customers affected, of course, we dispatch staff and we incur the overtime cost. But that is, uh, that is the situation. Don, can you confirm? I can confirm that. Right. Thank you. Uh, Honorable Chair, I think I've I've covered all of the questions. Right. Thank you very much. The last follow-up, Honorable Bukas will come in. Yeah. Thanks, Chair. Um, a follow-up on the Midupi uh, unit for explosion. Uh, we get the explanation. Yeah, you are giving us for the second time. The equipment that is at Midupi, the question is, isn't there an indication on each equipment that I have reached a maximum level of this particular uh, hydrogen or whatsoever? And therefore, once you exceed, I'm going to explode. That's my question. And if there is no such an indication, what do we do to avoid it? Because another human error is going to happen to the next uh, generator. Do we have such a sophisticated equipment which can indicate maximum levels of unnecessary uh, or foreign things that are happening in each and every generator? And do we have a mechanism to detect that? You are sitting in the office, you are an, a, 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 a senior manager monitoring the staff that's working in the technical area. Are you able to detect that what they are doing is correct or incorrect in order for you to intervene? That's the question. If we don't have that, what are we putting in place in order to avoid the situation of Unit 4, which has collapsed completely, and according to your report, is only going to come back to life next year. Okay. A response to the that next, follow the, no, the, the next follow-up is on the, the World Bank statement and the bloating uh, CEO. That's the World Bank statement that insinuated that. What's your belief? on the staff complement of ESCOM. And two, we cannot and we should not, I'm also saying this to the board chair, attribute the lack of thinking, the lack of systems of ESCOM management to the people. We remove services on weekends, simply because we cannot detect as ESCOM that a reference number which was issued on Friday has been carried over carelessly to Saturday to create overtime. That's not people's problem. It's a problem of ESCOM. And therefore, we can't use such mechanism of saying no work done on weekends for singular household because you are effectively creating overtime for yourself. It cannot be. It's, it's not people's fault. ESCOM must fix its own systems. Be able to follow reference numbers and see as they are issued out, 
are they being executed? If they are not being executed, the system must be able to say, you are applying for overtime on a Saturday on a reference number of Friday. Why is your system not picking that up? It can't be the people's problem. Okay. Thank you very much. Right. Let's get responses to that, please. Uh, Jay, my, my assessment, and we are doing work to uh, reassess the necessary staff complement. But if we look at the extensive investments that are required to roll out uh, the transmission grid in excess of 8,000 kilometers that uh, is required to be built, if we look at the requirement for the just energy transition to ensure that we can execute on the mandate to uh, transition to a lower carbon economy in a responsible way that we don't leave communities behind, then I think um, as well, if I may add a, a third factor, uh, the demographics of the organization. Uh, we have many of our key operations people approaching retirement age. They need to be replaced. They need to uh, be in the system for long enough to be able to transfer their skill to the, the youngsters coming in. Uh, otherwise, we repeat the same mistake as we made in the past of, of not paying enough attention to skills transfer. So my my conviction, and it's based on analysis also by our human resources department, is that uh, we we are uh, probably at the right level of headcount right now. And if we if we cut further, I think we are going to run the risk of losing more skills and becoming uh, even less reliable. Thank you, Chair. Responses to detection of and hydrogen and the overtimes. Uh, uh, yes. Right. Sir? Thank you, Chair. Yeah, we our procedure and hence I was saying it's a it's a human error incident. So our procedure actually requires that at at, at each interval of paging, the, the activity that was being carried out is called paging. So we page this in closed generation cham generating chamber so which normally contains hydrogen uh, during operation for cooling so in this instance uh, what needs to happen is that when you have patched the no, one no you're taking us back sir. the question is is there no illustration or what i think that's the the guide i think we've captured that it's, part yeah <laughs> bam, 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 wait, wait, wait. I wanted to make a clear yeah. example, Chair. Bam. When you reverse a car and you are very close to another object, it goes tweet, 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 okay, on that any tweet. car. Okay. So that's all right, what, that's all, right. All, right. all right, all right, all right, colleagues, oh, colleagues. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. What I was saying is that the, the procedure is you have to introduce each guess once you have passed that the, the one step is complete. So which means when you introduce CO2, you measure that there is no longer H2. So that is a manual process that the laboratory have to give you a certificate and say, this is, this is done. So what happened here is because what they are wait you see this is why you want to agitate they are asking you about is there no tweet 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 that's it the process this was explained at the site you've explained we get that part the issue is you do you have a reverse assistance mechanism for lack of a better phrase you have no matter we get that part yeah, I want to believe that the the tree, tree, tree is a measure of an explosive mixture in the generator. It's not there. Right. So the the answer is no. Right. No. That's what it is. It's not there. If it was there, the human error might not have happened. So that's it. The point is captured, which is something has to be done ar around it. Honorable. And then there's the the last issue you raised about overtime and the carryovers on Friday, I think the point is captured. Um, right, uh, COO, you were saying? Honorable Chair, I've taken note about the fact that uh, Honorable Member said, you know, it's going to need to get the act together. You can't have an outage or a, a, a somebody that is 
reported a fault during the week and it's carried on up until the weekend. I've taken that point and I note that. All right. So, all right. Honorable Pukas. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Pukas will be the last one and then we'll wrap it up. Any other questions I will suppress and they will come in and write. I won't even ask my questions and I've got two pages of them. Thank you, Chair. Chair, I will be very short. Uh, in welcoming the, the new board, I, I want to hear from the chair of the board. Do you see any light in the tunnel? And uh, you say that you already have three sessions. I want to make a proposal for your next session of three items. The first one will be hashtag reimagine ESCOM. The second one is how to keep the lights on. And the third one uh, I want to propose is to how can you better your communication with municipalities for the impact on the recovering of your financial losses? Because, and also for the municipalities to understand the billing system of ESCOM, because I think that's the problem uh, with the non-payment of municipalities. Then, Chair, uh, just a short one on the ESCOM presentation. Uh, the appointment of, of 40 employees in the supply chain uh, management department. I want to know, is it new post? And was it part of the organogram? And why only filling it now? And what is the impact on the budget? Then a uh, short one to the SIU. Uh, in some cases, you say that it's withdrawn. I don't understand based on what. Is it evidence or or why are cases withdrawn? And then under recommendations in on the SAU report, you say that, that you want to or they must monitor the lifestyle and financial transactions of high risk officials. Uh, high risk. Is it officials that are still in ESCOM or, or how are they high risk officials? Thank you, Chair. I will leave the, the other ones. Thank you. But can we get responses to, to that? Oh, Chairman. Can I proceed, Chair? Please do. Thank you, Honorable Chair. Um, Honorable Chair, Honorable Members, let me start off by just acknowledging all your various inputs that were directed at the board. Um, we've been taking copious notes, as I'm sure you've been observing. So we uh, we would see the benefit of today's session to be an understanding of what is top of mind to the various members of the committee. So please rest assured that we've uh, taken full note. Uh, thank you for the the pointers, Honorable Lucas. We've taken note. Lucas, so my apologies. F first first day in the committee, my apologies. I will get it. I don't know why she doesn't see it as a promotion because Honorable Lucas is the deputy I'll, chair I'll get of the NCOP, so <laughs> she must receive the blessing. All right, proceed, chair. Um, I assure you that next time we, we return to this committee, you will see the difference of a board that has immersed itself in the work that it's been assigned. And uh, hopefully you will see that when we say we're an active board, you will see that active board. So today allow us to simply absorb, uh, take note, and I show you that uh, we've taken on board the various pointers that you've uh, sent in our direction. Thank you very much. Right. Thank you, SIU. Um, the questions around. Um... No, thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Honorable Lucas. Um, on the monitoring of the high risk officials, um, and high risk is defined possibly by where the you know, employers would be uh, employed in which division. Uh, and it could be that there's other divisions. So, so there needs to be a risk assessment done across the business uh, in terms of which areas do they need to focus at. But we just gave, for example, 
uh, those employees in the procurement space, which is the supply chain management. Uh, but if you look at uh, the, the corruption and the siphoning of money, uh, in the main has been in the procurement process. Uh, whether it's senior managers that are involved in colluding with uh, service providers and so on, so, so the other area could be, you know, the area of uh, senior managers where the procurement uh, or the business areas where the procurement is done. Because in a procurement process, you will have a business owner and you will have a uh, you'll have a SCM uh, official uh, that's uh, that's enabling the business to procure. So, so, so from where we sit, we're saying um, the assessment needs to be done, but in the main, uh, in the procurement value chain. Uh, those those officials has to be prioritized for lifestyle analysis. With regard to the withdrawals, uh, and I'll ask my colleague to 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 come in. Uh, uh, in the normal run of litigation, um, uh, including you know the disciplinary processes or any any uh, process where alleg allegations or charges are withdrawn. It could simply be because uh, there's insufficient evidence or either there has been representations made uh, which are understandable and then they led to, to, to a withdrawal. But uh, in, ca in cases where withdrawals are made based on insufficient evidence, we would like to know so that uh, if we're able to, then we can source that information so that charges can be brought uh, and disciplinary action can be made, but I'm going to allow my colleagues to just to add on on the on this part of the withdrawal of cases. It's mainly disciplinary cases that have been withdrawn. Thank you, Advocate, um, Honourable Chair, Honourable Members. Uh, I can confirm that the matters that have been withdrawn uh, have not been withdrawn on the basis of insufficient evidence. In the normal process of a disciplinary action against an employee, the employee is also called upon to give reasons as to why they should not be disciplined. And these are the instances that we've reported in these matters where the employee has made submissions to ESCO management and ESCO management has accepted those submissions. And in that regard, those matters have been withdrawn. Uh, Honorable Chair, thanks. So on this last one, we could probably be characterized as speaking on behalf of management, uh, and, and hopefully they can confirm what we're saying, because they are the ones who get the information, the evidence, and they assess and listen to the employees and ultimately withdraw. But uh, if what we are explaining uh, coincides with their views, then it's okay. Management, yes or no, we are off near. Uh, Honourable Chair, if I can ask Jaintree Sankar, the CPO, to respond to the supply chain management and the 14 new position. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. So I can confirm that these are not new positions. We've had a long period of my predecessors not filling in vacancies and, and having staff leave and, and uh, you know, unusually long periods of people acting in positions and therefore you're not getting the stability and the credibility that you need. And of course, that skills gap is then causing us not to be able to deliver our mandate. So yes, it is in the budget. Yes, it is in the structures. And most of them are to fill vacancies or long periods of acting. Okay. All right. I'm going to like to take this opportunity to a roundup, Honorable Bukas, I know that you're supposed to get a bite for follow-ups. Um, there were questions that were not responded to. Um, the contractor at Ingula is one of them that Honorable Lee said asked the name of that contractor. Um, the rest, insofar as the details around the mine, we were looking at the program just now and Parliament's program, and we may tentative, tentatively say we will look at visiting the mine on the 25th of November, Friday the 25th, but we're looking at the program of parliament and it seems there's a day that may be viable for that, but we'll discuss it, uh, colleagues, but I thought give a ballpark it roundabout of when we'll do that. Colleagues, the issues you have raised around 
um, the municipal debt. We've got that meeting of the uh, around municipal debt to ESCOM on the 15th of November in the program. So we'll ventilate further on those issues um, on that day. Um, there was a duplication in the program that we had of activities on the prioritization of reports. And so the suggestion is that we have the SSA on the 9th uh, of November. Because it's an outstanding matter in any case that we have been looking at, but we will discuss these are just so that we can take forward um, the issues. As I said, I've got a long list of questions. I will not ask them. An opportunity will avail itself, but I think my constituents would be very upset with me if I don't raise this matter with ESCOM that they had asked me to raise. On the 1st of August, uh, in the Esnyatini area in Umbumbul, on the south coast, upper south coast Mbumbulu area, a transformer exploded. Up to now, there has been nothing that has happened and they are living a very difficult life. Um, so the people of Esnyatin in the Mumbuli area asked me to raise that. For them, it's an incident they say it took place on the 1st of August and nothing has happened uh, since then. But we'll speak, I'll send you the relevant um, details so then at the very least it can receive um, attention. The two things I want to, to say is that South Africans want certainty and clarity on the issue of load shedding. And I've noticed a trend at ESCOM of late to speak in what I can only call gray language area or parables. And the worst case label I can give it is obfuscation. When speaking about load shedding to say there's, there's seemingly no commitment or to when. Say, well, round about this date, but I can't. No, no, no. The people need certainty. The economy needs certainty. We need certainty so that we can be able to benchmark oversight and accountability against something. It can't be open-ended. So what we are requesting the board to do in the assessments that you are doing is to look at the root cause and the material areas which are causing us to arrive at load shedding and a deliberate focus action plan to deal with those. So that if it's four years, tell the country now, look, for the next four years, you stuffed. That's it, that's your reality. Live with it, deal. Rather, you know, be frank like a bullet. But this killing a slowly kind of thing, which I, one year, and then, then the one year is up, no, it's one year. And then when the one year is up, and they, no, just tell us now. It's good for planning, it's good for certainty, it's good for every put, for small businesses, for everyone to know good. Let us plan ourselves. I just, I don't get this because otherwise we normalize load shedding as a, as a permanent reality if it's open-ended. So that then if you say four years, then in four years time, we ask you, why do we still have load shedding? But it can't be right. So I'm seeing this new trend emerging. We got gray area. I know, nias half clash kind of vibes. Nias uh, on, shy on, on this thing. I no no no. Please don't do that. My final point is this, Mr. Chairman. Ultimately, the fiduciary responsibilities that you have means the buck stops with you. And understanding, of course, the dichotomy of how any SOE is structured. We've got the executives and the boards, and then there's the politics that we can discuss. But the fiduciary responsibilities, insofar as the performance and functioning and fulfillment of mandate of ESCOM is concerned, the buck stops with you. I want to clarify that today so that there is no disagreement tomorrow when we put the hard questions. At times, our engagements will be difficult, they will be unkind. That is the nature of oversight, that is the nature of parliament. So that there is never a time when we have to be put on the back foot for other considerations which are not material to the work that we do. 
So my only statement, after all is said and done, after all these questions have been raised and the answers that you have given, the taste of the pudding is in the eating. And the board must leave here knowing that we will hold the board accountable. There's no two ways about it. As difficult as it may be at times. So I'm glad that this meeting coincided with the arrival of the new board. Uh, we wish you well in the execution of your duties and responsibilities. And hopefully you will render us jobless this side by doing the right things. We are the only people in this country for all intents and purposes who are applying to be unemployed. Because if everybody does the right thing, then there's no jobs for us. But the fact that we are still here, yeah, and not for the SIU either and the Hawks. <laughs> but it, it, that, that's the extent to which you must view it. That for so long as there is a need for you to appear here or any other department, then you've not arrived where you should arrive. So today we may have been nice people. Um, that's what we generally do to new boards. But I do want to say, Chair, because you say you'll have these meetings and the consideration that you'll have with the executive CEO. And I think there has to be a candid discussion around the PFMA. We would appreciate your assessment of the pros and cons of the PFMA as an enabler or otherwise of the performance of SOEs and ESCOM specifically. Because where there are challenges, then we must resolve them. Does it provide the necessary agility? I mean, with that is required and necessary for you to compete in the energy space. The same applies for SAPC, which if they want to replace a disk, they must go through the prescribed notion ENCA Newsroom Africa, the 24 other 24 hour news channels go down the road, buy it and put it in there and they keep it moving. Those are the other difficult discussions we must have so that we as a committee assist the business agility, not a blank check, but to say, where are the challenges? And then begin to have that discussion and see how with National Treasury we can assist. On that note, I would like to thank you very much. We will, we will talk to them on the, I've given you three dates of when you will be seeing these people. Any other question you raise on that day? Uh, Mr. Chairman and the executives, thank you. Head of unit, Advocate TV, thank you very much. General Libby and your team, head of the Hawks, um, thank you very much. And to the executives of um, ESCOM led by the CEO, um, thank you very much. Colleagues, we wish you safe traveling messes and all the best in the execution of your duties. Um, there is lunch. It's down the passage, ne? Uh, the passage that we've been using at the back. We're inviting you to lunch. I know the kitchen is very upset with us. We are late, but food makes people smile. So they will be all right when we get there. So please do join us for the bite. And colleagues, tomorrow, four o'clock in this venue, National Skills Fund. The meeting stands adjourned.